thank you very much for the hospitality. I certainly want to add my welcome to Dr. Dunlap's, but before I start, I always like to have a couple of little surveys here so I know who I'm talking to. I'll start out, uh, how many of you are here because you heard a radio program? Isn't it amazing? How many of you are here because a friend invited you to come? That's great. How many of you are here because you thought this was a tax protest meeting? <laughs> You get more than two people together in America, it's a tax protest meeting. <clears throat> One last piece. Uh, how many of you grew up on a farm or still have anything to do with livestock? Raise your hand. Okay, great, 50%. Well, we're gonna get along fine. We'll bring everybody else along with us. Uh, myself, I grew up on a farm, a beef farm in Missouri, about 80 miles west of St. Louis. And like everybody else that raises livestock, we uh, raise a lot of our own feed, corn and soybeans and hay. And we grind this up into a flour, and we'd add vitamins and minerals and trace minerals to this. We'd make pellets or cake out of it and feed those calves for about six to nine months before we'd ship them off to be butchered, say back the very best ones for our own family, of course. And the thing that fascinated me as a teenager was the fact that we ate out of those very same fields. We uh, had a garden at the end of the field. We grew peas and beans and squash and peppers and whatnot. Uh, we also uh, saved back five rows of corn for the family, and we wanted to live to be 100 with no aches and pains, and we didn't do the same thing for ourselves that we did for those calves. And as a teenager, this was very fascinating for me, and I always used to ask my dad, I'd say, hey, Pops, how come we go to all that trouble for those calves? We grind up their feet, add vitamins and minerals and trace minerals, and feed them for six to nine months, knock them in the head and eat them. And we, out of those very same fields, don't do that for ourselves. And of course, being a Missouri farmer, he'd give me a lot of Missouri farm wisdom. He'd say things like, shut up, boy. <laughs> If you're getting farm fresh food, fresh air, free exercise, don't ask complicated questions. So I was glad when I got rid of that farm exercise and went to the University of Missouri and got into ag school. My major was in animal husbandry and nutrition. My minor was in field crops and soils. But I really didn't get an answer to my basic question until I became a freshman veterinary student at the University of Missouri. And as a freshman veterinary student, what I learned was the reason we put vitamins and minerals and trace minerals into animal feeds is because we don't have insurance for them. We don't have Blue Cross, Blue Shield, major medical hospitalization. <clears throat> we don't have Medicare, Medicaid, or a Hillary to watch out for them. <laughs> and as a result, if we were to use a human healthcare type of system for livestock, it'd be a real sticker shock for most people. Uh, because of the veterinary care, the uh, hamburger would cost $275 a pound and boneless, skinless chicken breasts would be $450 a pound. So to keep things on an even keel where everybody could get at this meat, uh, we learned that we could prevent and cure diseases with nutrition. Now, after graduating vet school, I got diverted for a couple of years and went to Africa and worked with Marlon Perkins from the old Mutual of Omaha Wild Kingdom days. And that was a lot of fun. You know, people always ask you when you're a veterinarian, are you a large animal vet or a small animal vet? Well, I was an extra large animal vet because I worked with elephants and rhinos and things like that for a couple of years. Got to be Frank Buck, used a tranquilizer gun and got to move animals all across uh, Africa and to Europe and the United States. In fact, many of the African elephants and rhinos that you see in wild animal parks and zoos are ones that I either caught or offsprings of one that I caught. Now, after two years of doing that, Marlon sent me a telegram and invited me back to the States to work on a big project. Uh, the National Institutes of Health had given him seven and a half million dollars to study pollution in the mid-60s. This is when we first recognized that there was pollution in our air and our water and our food, and nobody quite knew what that meant over a long period of time. And so uh, uh, we had many, many projects going on in the mid-60s. But one of them, the one that I was working on, was one where uh, I had to do autopsies of animals that died of natural causes in the big zoos around the United States. And I was to look for a, a species of animals that was ultra-sensitive to pollution. And we were going to use that species of animals, much like the old coal miners used to use, um, a canary. You know, they take the canary down the mine, and the uh, canary would act as an early warning system. If methane gas or carbon monoxide would leak out into the mine, uh, the canary would drop off the perch and die long before the men were in danger. We we're going to take uh, these animals and put them in little strategic spots all around the world and um, uh, pay attention to them. And if they started dying, we knew we were in danger. Well, to make a long story short, after some um, 12 years, working at the St. Louis Zoo and the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago, the Bronx Zoo in New York, the National Zoo in D.C., the L.A. Zoo, and many other big ones throughout the United States. I had done some 17,500 autopsies and over 454 species of animals, plus 3,000 human beings who lived in close proximity to the zoos for a comparison. And what I learned was pretty frightening. 
Every one of those animals and every one of the people who died of natural causes died of a nutritional deficiency disease. And that got me very excited, and I wrote, as Dr. Dunlap said, I wrote uh, 75 scientific papers, uh, eight textbooks about that big. Uh, you have to pay $140 for those textbooks. I'm not sure that uh, the medical students ever read them, but they had to buy them to pass the course. It was one of those kind of things. So uh, I was on 2020 with Hugh Downs and Geraldo before he got his nose broken, was on every network TV. Back then, it was only three networks, uh, 1,700 newspapers, lectured all across the United States back in the late 60s and early 70s, just like I'm doing now. And I couldn't get anybody excited about those findings because we had just put men on the moon. We had a high-tech Cold War going on with the Soviets, and we had just uh, committed $23 billion with a B, $23 billion, which is a lot of money back then, to finding cures and vaccines for cancer. And uh, so talking about nutritional deficiency diseases 30, 35 years ago in America was pretty low on everybody's totem pole. But I knew it was important, so I got frustrated enough. I went back to school for four years up in Portland, Oregon, became a physician, and I practiced for 12 years in a general family practice, uh, took care of uh, chainsaw wounds, delivered babies, looked at hemorrhoids, you know, all the fun things of life. And I was always very honest with my patients. I always put my veterinary degree on the wall along with the medical degree. <laughs> and of course, the new patients, for some reason, they'd always focus in on that veterinary degree. And they say, Doc, I'm here for a physical. Uh, am I in the right place? Looks like a vet's office. And uh, if I saw that they were from the farm, I always kept one of these full-length obstetrical gloves they used for AI. And <laughs> examining mirrors and cows, you know, I put that on and they'd backstroke out of the office because they knew, they knew what that was for. And the nurses would have to chase them down and say, Doc, don't terrorize the patients like that. But uh, the, the most fun I had, of course, was using everything I'd learned in veterinary nutrition on my human patients. And it was no great surprise to me that it just worked like a charm. And what I'm going to do tonight is share with you a lot of what I learned. And if you take home just 10% of what I share with you, you're going to save yourself an enormous amount of unnecessary misery. You're going to save yourselves a gob of money, and you're going to add many, many healthful years to your life. There's no extra charge if you want to take home 50% or 100%, but I'll feel good and sleep well tonight if you just take home 10%. Well, let's get started. And, and uh, to do that, I'm going to tell you that the human being has the genetic capacity, the, the capability of living healthfully to be 120 to 140, and I'm going to prove that to you in a second. There's no doubt about it. Unfortunately, Americans don't do a very good job when it comes to this. And when the uh, World Health Organization kind of looked at the top 32 industrialized nations uh, on Earth and, and said, uh, how long do these people live? Who lives the longest? We rank 17th in longevity. There's actually 16 other countries whose people who live longer than we did. These are industrialized nations now. Uh, then we rank 19th in healthfulness. That means there was 18 other countries whose peoples live longer than we do before they develop diabetes, heart disease, arthritis, osteoporosis, and so forth. We rank 23rd in live births and first year of survivability of our babies. And we rank dead last, 32nd out of 32, when it came to preventing birth defects. All these statistics really mean is that we have the most expensive health care system in the world, but not the best. And that's why many of you are here tonight, because uh, you're seeking some information. Well, there's no less than six cultures on Earth whose peoples routinely live to be 120 to 140. And I'm just going to give you a very brief description. There's two places that you can actually pick up a lot of details. Number one is the January 1973 issue of National Geographic. And if you don't have the National Geographic stacked up in your garage like I do, you can go to any library and pick them up. Again, that's January 1973. They did a special issue on these cultures who lived to be over 120 to 140. And then my wife and I wrote a book in November of 1994, about eight months ago now, and that book in chapter eight is called The Age Beaters, not The Egg Beaters, The Age Beaters. And it goes into an enormous amount of detail of what these people do uh, culturally and diet-wise and so forth to live healthily to 120 to 140. Now, just very briefly, these cultures include the mountain tribes of Tibetans. And these people were made famous uh, in 1933 at the death of a fellow by the name of Wu Li. And he was born in 1677. And if you're quick with numbers, you'll notice that he died at age 256. And when he was 106, uh, the Chinese imperial government began publishing his birth dates and birthday parties every year for 150 years. When he died, his obituary was in every newspaper in the world because he'd been tracked for many, many years and everybody knew him. 
And a year after he died, a, a Pulitzer Prize winning book was published for which uh, his life was the inspiration for this book. It was called Lost Horizon. And many of you will recall that story in that book that talked about the Valley of Shangri-La where people could uh, live to be over 200 if they led a good Christian life and, and um, in fact, uh, it was a humble agrarian farmed and, and gardened and they shunned the evil and the uh, violence of the outside world. They could live to be over 200. And so if you haven't read that book, I'd urge you to do it. And then about three years later, they made it into a black and white movie. Again, his life was the inspiration for that movie. And if you have access to a blockbuster video store, you can actually rent that original movie, a Lost Horizon. Then what is now uh, Eastern Pakistan? The Hunzas are legendary for living healthily to be over 120. And if you've hung around health food stores and read alternative health literature and nutrition literature for years, you've run into the name of the Hunzas. They've been held up as being very healthful and long-lived people for over 50 years. And then uh, during the 1970s, Dan and Yogurt made the Russian Georgians famous. Some of you remember that ad. Uh, prior to this ad, uh, nobody could spell yogurt in America. And afterwards, of course, everybody wanted it. Uh, this is where a 140-year-old guy from Russian Georgia wore a uniform from the Crimea War, a war that took place 120 years previous, had all his medals, held up a big saber in one hand and had a cup of Dan and yogurt in the other hand, smiled a lot and waved it around. You're supposed to believe that it was uh, Dan and yogurt that made him live to be 140. It was a very impressive ad because uh, he had his son standing next to him who was 120 and his grandson who was 100 and his great-grandson who was uh, 80 and so forth. So it was a very believable ad. Then uh, after the breakup of the Soviet Union a few years ago, we began learning about other cultures in that same mountain range, the Caucasus Mountains, the Azerbaijanis, Abkhazians, Turkestanis, uh, and uh, the Russians studied all of these people for some 70 years and literally wrote thousands of scientific papers on their physical exams and their diets and blood tests and hair analysis, trying to figure out what it was that made these people special, because they were different races, different religions, but they had the common denominator of health and longevity. Then in the Western Hemisphere, uh, we actually have two peoples that are famous for longevity. Both are in the Andes Mountains, uh, the Vilcabamba Indians in the Andes Mountains of um, uh, Ecuador, and in southeastern Peru, just east of the um, Peruvian city, the Aztec city of Machu Picchu, the Titicacas. I just like them because it's a fun name, the Titicacas. I mean, as an adult, how often can you say that and get away with it? <laughs> now remember, I'm from Missouri. And uh, we're a bunch of hard-headed Dutchmen there in Missouri, and it, it's so noticeable, and everybody knows it. So on our license plate, it says, we're the show-me state. I mean, we believe nothing of what we hear and only half of what we see, and so it's pretty hard to pull the wool over our eyes. And, uh, of course, we have a bunch of farm sayings there, like I know you do here. Uh, one of my favorites is, the proof is in the pudding. That means you can tell me you're a good cook, but uh, until I taste your cooking, I'm not going to believe you. And uh, one of my hobbies, I have several hobbies, but one of my hobbies is collecting theories on health and longevity and over the years, I've taken these theories and examined them to see if the proof was in the pudding. Was there any reality uh, to these things? Was there anything to support these claims that these theories worked? So I'm going to show you a few of them, and let's have a look. Uh, one of the more popular ones now is the Paleolithic diet and lifestyle. This is where you're supposed to live like a caveman. And of course, uh, you can't eat uh, corn-fed beef from Iowa. Uh, you have to chase down low-fat antelope by foot. You can't use an ATV or a rifle or a bow and arrow. You have to choke them to death with your bare hands. <laughs> You're supposed to eat everything raw, right, You're, and um, live like a caveman. If you don't sweat in your labors, you're supposed to join a health club and sweat three times a week. And that's the caveman or the Paleolithic lifestyle. Well, let's have a look and see if the proof is in the pudding. The only real hard evidence we have is this fellow here, old Otzi. And uh, he was made famous uh, because his mummified corpse was found in the Otzvel Valley of um, Italy when a glacier began to melt and recede. And when they found his corpse, uh, all the tools and weapons he had with him were pure copper. So they knew he was from the Copper Age, somewhere between four and 6,000 years ago. And when they did carbon dating of his tissues, they found that uh, he actually died 5,300 years ago. And through examinations of his uh, body, uh, they figured he died in the prime of life, somewhere between 25 and 40 years of age. And they did a series of x-rays on him to see if he had any of the diseases that plagued modern man. And what they found was very surprising. Number one, they found out that he had severe degenerative arthritis of the cervical vertebrae of his neck, the lumbar vertebrae of his lower back, and both hips. And even more surprising, he had severe advanced calcification and arteriosclerosis of his coronary arteries in his heart, the AR to pulmonary artery coming out of his heart and the large iliac arteries going down into his legs. 
So the proof isn't in the pudding. And I guarantee you, he didn't eat three eggs every morning for breakfast and certainly didn't eat any Big Macs or hamburgers or anything like that or corn-fed beef. So um, the proof is not in the pudding for the Paleolithic lifestyle or diet. Then uh, there's the live cell ther theory. Uh, this is where you're supposed to get injections of um, extracts of placenta of sheep or cattle or embryonic tissues. You're supposed to get the DNA and the RNA, and this is supposed to rejuvenate you, and you're supposed to get 20 years or 50 years younger and live to be over 100. And let's have a look and see if the proof is in the pudding for that. Uh, Dr. Peter Steffen here was a homeopathic physician. This is from uh, 1994. Um, and he... Uh, uh, had a clinic in London. He went all around Europe and lectured and told people about his elixir of youth and please come to his clinic in London and he would give you these injections and of course if he took his own stuff the proof is not in the pudding for the uh, live cell therapy because he died at age 50 from a cardiomyopathy heart attack which is in fact a simple selenium deficiency. Let me ask you real quick, how many of you know what uh, stiff lamb disease or white muscle disease is? Raise your hand. Okay, sure, all the farmers who deal with livestock. What, what causes that? What, what do you know causes it? A deficiency of selenium. Deficiency of selenium, you bet. Okay. Then, isn't it amazing how farmers know these things and doctors don't? Another one of these uh, theories has gotten real popular lately since Deepak Chopper wrote uh, something like four best-selling books on the body, life, spirit thing, body, mind, spirit. This is where you're supposed to meditate a lot and do yoga and eat uh, vegan or vegetarian diets. And just growing up on the farm, I just knew as a boy that that wasn't going to work out because uh, back when I was a kid, two things didn't work out, let alone body, mind, spirit. I remember we used to entertain ourselves, you know, by patting our head and rubbing our stomach, and all somebody had to do was make a face at you, and you get derailed. And, and so uh, thinking about living to be over 100 with the body, mind, spirit thing didn't sound right. And certainly the proof is not in the pudding for that. Uh, Rita Guerra. Uh, who was the premier meditation and yoga instructor in the Western Hemisphere and director of the Himalayan Institute, uh, was a vegan, didn't supplement with any vitamins or minerals and didn't eat any animal products, died at age 55 from a cardiomyopathy heart attack, a simple selenium deficiency disease, even though she was spiritually elevated. <laughs> I think you get the picture. <laughs> Now, the one that the physicians are really into now, the ones that are really into it, uh, is the Mediterranean diet. They love this Mediterranean diet thing. This is where you're supposed to give up red meat, and you're supposed to rip the chicken skin off your chicken and eat a lot of fish, and uh, you're supposed to eat lots of vegetables and grains, lots of pasta, you know, and breads and things. Little wine's okay, according to the Mediterranean diet. But the proof is not in the pudding for the Mediterranean diet. First of all, because the average lifespan for the Greeks and the Italians, who eat the most of it, is 75.5, just like us. So there's no longevity benefit for that diet. And here's a specific example. Uh, Pope John Paul II, of course, has been in Italy for the last 15 or so years. Uh, he just turned 75 years old about uh, four years ago. Not four years, four weeks ago, excuse me, four weeks ago. And um, he has uh, um, degenerative arthritis. He has osteoporosis sufficient to the point where he had to have uh, uh, hip replacement surgery. He has failing health, doesn't have stamina anymore, where he has to cancel 50% of his speaking engagements. And, uh, I mean, you would like to think that if anybody in Italy would get the very best that the Mediterranean diet could offer would be the Pope, right? And unless he's been sneaking sausage in from Poland under the table uh, and eating that all the time, uh, the proof is not in the pudding for the Mediterranean diet. Now, one of my heroes in the alternative health field for many, many years, of course, was Linus Pauling. And Linus was famous for a variety of things. Uh, number one, he was one of two people who ever had two Nobel Prizes. I mean, this guy was a genius when it came to biochemistry and biology and zoology. Uh, nobody could argue with his intelligence, and certainly he was probably one of the more intelligent human beings in our century, and maybe ever. <clears throat> the other thing he was famous for uh, was his interest in vitamin C. And he believed that you could get everything you needed from your four food groups. You get all the vitamins and minerals and amino acids and fatty acids you needed from your four food groups. However, because of the stresses of modern day life and the pollution in the air and water and food, he believed you needed extra vitamin C. And to prove that that would help you live a long, healthful life, he faithfully took 10,000 milligrams of vitamin C every day for 35 years. Didn't take any other supplements, but he took 10,000 milligrams of vitamin C every day for 35 years. And of course, he died at age 93 uh, from a um, widely disseminated prostate cancer. And here's, after I've read all his books and papers and scientific literature and so forth and listened to his tapes and uh, looked at his videos and whatnot, 
and reading things on vitamin C myself, here's what I can guarantee you. If you faithfully take 10,000 milligrams of vitamin C every day for 35 years, and you're a woman, I can guarantee you you will never get prostate cancer. <laughs> Now, how, how old can you live to be in America? And according to the Guinness World Book of Records, this little gal here, Margaret Skeet, um, actually died at age 115 in 1994, a year ago. And uh, she looks pretty good for 115, doesn't she? Looks a lot better than these 25-year-olds who subsist on Pepsis and Ding Dongs and things like that. <laughs> And she was very bright, didn't have Alzheimer's, and she died of a nutritional deficiency disease. She actually fell and broke her hip from osteoporosis. Uh, three weeks later, she was dead. She died of pneumonia. This is not unusual because 75% <clears throat> of the people over age 65 in America who break a hip or a major leg bone don't live 90 days. They die of complications of that fracture. Ava Gabor, just last week, died at age 74, fractured her hip, went into the hospital. Five days later, she was dead from pneumonia. Doesn't matter how much money you have, if you have a calcium deficiency, it's going to get you, okay? <clears throat> this little gal here is very interesting. Her name is Jean Calment from France, turned 120 February 21st of this year, 1995. And uh, the thing that I found interesting, of course, uh, she was much sharper than her doctors, and they were only able to get her to quit smoking after they put her in a nursing home at age 120. <laughs> <clears throat> they were afraid that it was going to shorten her life. <laughs> And uh, what a great lady. And there's no reason why she can't live to be 140 because she doesn't have cancer, heart disease, or high blood pressure, or diabetes. And this little gal here, Susie Brunson, according to her family, died at age 123 in December of 1994. And <clears throat> this, was, uh, this claim was based on the, uh, the fact that her birth date, December 25th, 1870, was recorded in the family Bible. And I assume that she died of a natural cause because they didn't say that she died of an overdose or recreational drugs or drive-by shooting or anything like that. <laughs> this fellow here, Bauer, uh, chief of the third world country of Niger, died at age 126. And one of his wives was eulogizing him at his funeral and said that he still was in possession of all his own teeth when he died at age 126, which means he didn't have any osteoporosis, number one. And I think she was bragging on him, you know, kind of in the back door that perhaps other parts of his anatomy still function too at age 126. This fellow here from another third world country of Syria died at age 133. And, of course, uh, he was in the Guinness World Book of Records, not because he was 133. Many people live longer than that, as you will see. And um, uh, he remarried at the age of 80 for the fourth time. That didn't get him in the Guinness World Book of Records. All I have to do is go to Vegas and sit in front of those little chapels, you see that. But the fact that he fathered four boys and five girls with the same wife after the age of 80, you know, nine months for the pregnancy and then breastfeeding and a little time in between his baby, he was still fathering children after the age of 100. That's what got him into the Guinness World Book of Records. So there's hope for some of you guys in the back of the room. <laughs> now, this little gal here from Iran, according to them, in January 1995, died at age 161. She's getting close to Hunza. The village that she lived in was very close to the Hunzas. <clears throat> died at age 161. And the interesting thing about her obituary is uh, it's, uh, she was survived by six living children who ranged in age between 120 and 128. They hadn't even left home to go to college yet. <laughs> and then another thing I found interesting was um, uh, her oldest son said his mother had never visited a doctor, never took any pharmaceuticals or drugs, did take a few herbs during her life, and so there's a beginning to be a message developed here, right? Now, these are a couple of birthday announcements, not obituaries. This fellow here, Shirali Mizmalov, uh, from Azerbaijan and Caucasus Mountains in Western Soviet Union at this time, May of 1973, turned 168. And he was featured in that 1973, January 1973 issue of uh, the, the National Geographic. And when he turned 168, some five months later, uh, he went out and hoed the garden to show reporters how vigorous he was at 168. Then, two years later, another uh, Russian, uh, Majid Gaev, turned 140. He was also from uh, Azerbaijan, and the literal translation of his village's name was a village of centenarians, people who lived to be 100. And 50% uh, of the people in his village at his birth date were over 100. <laughs> Lastly, on this longevity thing, 
1993, there were eight scientists who lived in this big dome, Biosphere 2, in Arizona for two years. And uh, when they came out in November of 1993, uh, these people uh, had lived in this dome for two years and they recycled everything, lived in a pollution-free environment. They uh, ate moderate calorie levels every day, took in large doses of vitamins and minerals. And when they came out, they had physical exams performed on them by doctors from the UCLA Medical School, University of California, Los Angeles. And they took all this data from the physical exams, blood tests, hair analysis, put the information into the medical computers, and the medical computers projected that they could live to be 165 based on all this data if they continued to do outside the dome what they had done inside the dome. So there's no doubt that human beings have the genetic capacity to live to be 120 to 140, and some extraordinary individuals are going to live to be 150 and 160, but there's no reason why the average age in America shouldn't be 100 instead of 75.5. Now, over the years, I've literally reviewed and read and, and examined uh, over a thousand pieces of literature on health and longevity, and no matter who writes it, or whether it's from Russia or Europe or the United States or the veterinary literature on the subject of health and longevity, uh, there, there's two basic themes that come out, and I call them concept number one, concept number two. That's what we're going to cover now. Concept number one for health and longevity is, uh, I, I call it, how to avoid stepping on the landmines. It's very simple, uh, things you don't want to do. Uh, that way you can survive long enough for the other thing to kick in, concept number two to kick in. Concept number one, you don't want to smoke, you don't want to abuse alcohol, you don't want to do drugs, you don't want to jog down the highway at two o'clock in the morning wearing an all-black ninja suit. You're gonna get hit by a car, right? <laughs> There's nothing greater than a mirror from a truck. <laughs> then, um, you don't want to jump out of a hot air balloon from 250 foot up with a 300 foot bungee cord on. <laughs> as crazy as that sounds, millions of Americans throw away their healthy physical bodies every year doing all these stupid things. So I take just a few seconds to remind you of that. Lastly, in concept number, one, uh, concept number one, if at all possible, you want to avoid going to a doctor because given half a chance, a doctor will kill you. Now, to some of you, that may seem a little flippant, right? So, gosh, this guy is really weird. And so I'm going to back that up with a little bit of a statistic here so that you know that I'm coming from the area of truth. Uh, January of 1973, Ralph Nader came out with the results of a three-year study on deaths in American hospitals. And it was very shocking what he came up with. He said, and this is a quote from his study, quote, 300,000 Americans are killed each year in hospitals alone as a result of medical negligence, unquote. 300,000. Now, that's each year. Now, to just to have a comparison, to understand how big a figure that is, let's compare that figure, 300,000 a year, with um, that's killed by the medical profession. He used the word killed. Let's compare it with 10 years of military losses in Vietnam, where we had 56,000 killed over 10 years by enemies that had artillery and explosives and bayonets and rifles trying to kill you. And that averaged out 5,600 a year. And for that, we had millions of people protest. They poured out into the streets. We had political anarchy the last three years of that 10-year war. We chased the president out of the presidency. We actually shot students in Kent State, Ohio, demonstrating against the war for 5,600 military personnel a year. Now, according to Ralph Nader, here's one profession who takes your tax money in the form of Medicare and Medicaid, turns around and kills 300,000 of you a year and you can't even find a crazy street preacher out here in any corner protesting it. All you find are people lined up at these electronic town hall meetings saying, Hillary, Hillary, we got to have more of that stuff free. Find a way to tax me so I can get it free. And I'm from Missouri, so I haven't figured out how that works yet. Now, one of the things you've seen uh, recently is um, advertisements in newspapers. This actually comes from a full-page ad in the New York Times on HMOs and doctors clinics, and they put their faces and pictures in there. And 10 years ago, if they would have done this, the state medical board would have taken away their licenses for unethical practices. They used to say five years ago even, after all, it was only quacks and chiropractors that would advertise in newspapers and phone books. But now the doctors are just, you know, the medical doctors are just shoving everybody out of the way to do this. And what they're trying to say is that if you join our HMO and give us this monthly fee, we'll give you a whole team of doctors for the price of one. I mean, you're going to get everything. doesn't matter if you need a head amputated or a wart taken off your toe. Um, you get a whole team for the price of one. Actually, this means that um, you have a 500% increase in risk of being damaged. <laughs> Now, 
Now, just about one year ago, Ralph Nader came out with another survey. This happened to be in the front page of every newspaper uh, in the land. And of course, uh, because this happened in July of 1994, uh, this is the time of the baseball strike, and, and people were jumping right to the sports page and missing this, so I saved it for you. This happens to be from the front page of the USA Today, and Ralph Nader said one year ago, 70% of the medical doctors who treat Medicare patients in America flunked the exam on how to prescribe to them safely and effectively. 70%. Now, what would happen to American Airlines if 70% of the pilots flunked the exam on how to fly? <laughs> what would happen to American Airlines if they killed 300,000 passengers a year? And why is there this difference between our acceptance of what an airline does and what the medical profession does? Here's an example of what Ralph Nader was talking about. He said 32,000 hip fractures each year are attributed to uh, prescribing by medical doctors that leaves the elderly unbalanced and, and dizzy. Uh, they try to avoid stepping on the grandkid and they fall and break a hip or they might get out of the bathtub or step out of a car and they break a hip or slide down the stairs. And this is a death sentence for 29,000 of them. Remember, 75% of the people over age 65 fracture a hip or major leg bone don't live 90 days. And I believe the only way to stop this is to make physicians responsible for this the same way that we make um, bartenders responsible when they give people too many drinks and let them drive home and they kill somebody else or themselves. And uh, you know, we put about 500 to 1,000 doctors in jail uh, for life without parole. Uh, they'll start paying attention to decimal points on the outside. <laughs> now, here's a quick look at the medications that should not be given to people over the age of 65 if they're up walking around. This is from Ralph Nader in the PDR, the physician's desk reference. And of course, 70% of American doctors uh, do prescribe these things on a regular basis to people over age 65. You're looking at high blood pressure medications, blood thinners, pain relievers, uh, diabetic medications, uh, arthritis medications, tranquilizers, sleeping pills, and this is the basis of the problem. Now, who is it that they kill? Is it just the homeless? You know, medical students go out in the dark of the night in their VW van and collect the homeless and take them into the basements of the medical centers and, and hospitals and practice on them. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter if you're homeless or you live in a big house. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor or if you're an embryo or a toddler or a teenager, middle age or a senior. It doesn't matter if you're educated or uneducated. If you go to a hospital, you're at risk. Now, Here's a quick example. This little gal here, Betsy Lehman, how many of you remember her story? It was just a couple of months ago, April, half a dozen, it's amazing. Betsy Lehman, 39 years old, was getting treated for breast cancer at age 39, and she was getting the last of a series of, of chemotherapy treatments over a period of five months, and she was the top medical reporter for the Boston Globe, which is the second largest newspaper in the United States. And she examined the records of all these uh, cancer treatment centers and chose uh, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston because to her it was the best in the world. And on their last treatment, they gave her a four-day dose every day for four days. They gave her a 16 times overdose and killed this 39-year-old woman with uh, an overdose of chemotherapy, even though she was the top medical reporter for the uh, Boston Globe. And here's one that'll even ring your bell even a little more. Jackie Kennedy. Uh, this picture was taken of her, and I lifted it out of a magazine because I think it's significant. This picture was taken of her three days before she entered the hospital for chemotherapy for the first treatment for cancer. She doesn't look like a terminal cancer patient. She was taking a stroll around Central Park on a brisk day with a friend, and she was diagnosed six months before her death with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a type of cancer that normally takes 10, 12, 15 years to kill you. It's relatively painless, and um, Jackie had 15 years left when she was diagnosed. There was no death watch on her when she entered the hospital for her chemotherapy, her first treatment. There was no reporter standing out there and giving you 15-minute updates. She kind of waved to the press, hey, I'm going in for some chemotherapy, no big deal, and nobody made a big hoo-ha out of it. Tuesday, she was dead. Four days later, she was dead, and you were supposed to believe that Jackie Kennedy died of cancer. Well, I'm a pathologist as well as a, a clinician, and I can guarantee you, as sure as God made little green apples, Jackie Kennedy did not die of cancer. She was killed with an overdose of chemotherapy just like Betsy Lehman, same. Now, if they can kill the top medical reporter uh, from the Boston Globe, they can kill a Jackie Kennedy, and not a single doctor was suspended. They didn't find the hospital. Nobody was sued. What chance do each and every one of you have? None, none, and none, okay? None, none, and none. Now, this goes on, according to Ralph Nader, because simply of greed. Uh, doctors don't want to start a landslide of, of having problems, and so they just kind of ignore all these things. And uh, this happened to be from the Washington Post editorial page, November 2nd, 1992, and the headline said, uh, Lining Doc's Pockets. 
If you go to your doctor, you want him to think of you as a patient, not a cash cow. You farmers know what a cash cow is, right? That's where you milk them, and you don't drink the milk, you sell it to pay your bills. But two studies in this month's New England Journal of Medicine, the top medical journal in America, shows that doctors are out to milk you dry. Then 10 months later, in one of my favorite little magazines, Reader's Digest, there's a great little article, and to me, the Reader's Digest is the sweetest little magazine that ever was. It never says anything negative about any individual or group. I mean, it's so neutral. You find it in the waiting rooms of politicians and lawyers and doctors. I mean, it doesn't offend anybody. But in this issue, September 1993, on page 77, it says, can you trust your doctor? And it lists 12 ways that doctors routinely scam money from patients and insurance. I'll just give you the worst one. You can go look up the other 11. According to Reader's Digest, not Joel Wallach, Doctors in America get $421 in kickbacks every time they send you in for a CAT scan or an MRI. You say, Doc really cares about me. He sent me in for an MRI. I just had this shoulder pain. <laughs> Cha-ching. <laughs> now, according to Reader's Digest, <laughs> according to Reader's Digest, uh, not Joel Wallach, the average doctor in America each year gets $226,681 in CAT scan and MRI kickbacks. That's almost a quarter of a million dollars. And you wonder why insurance keeps going up and you can't afford medical care. Now, one of my favorite surveys from Harvard Medical School was put out in 1972. And what they did was look at the use of illegal drugs uh, by medical doctors, and they looked at the illegal use of prescription drugs by medical doctors, and what they found out was pretty terrifying. What they found out in 1972 was that 52% of all licensed medical doctors in America used psychotropic drugs illegally every week. 52% every week. Uh, you're looking at uh, speed, cocaine, marijuana, opium derivatives, and other drugs like fentanyl, anesthetics, and so forth. And so next time you go to a doctor, if you still choose to go after tonight, uh, <laughs> don't be too excited about the degrees he has hanging on the wall. You want to look at the pupils of his eyes and see if he's gorked out before you let him diagnose you. <laughs> or uh, <laughs> do surgery on you. Then even scarier yet, uh, were 78% of the medical students use psychotropic drugs illegally every week, 78%. And here's an example. This fellow here was a pediatrician. Uh, his obituary appeared in the front page of the Union Tribune in San Diego, December of 1994. And he was a 30-year-old pediatrician, took care of babies, right? And uh, he died of a self-inflicted overdose of these recreational drugs. And said, uh, eulogizing, said, uh, oh, he saved the lives of children but lost his own. And in the article it said, he devoted his whole life to caring for children. Well, he must have been a babysitter most of his life because he was only out of school, medical school, for three years. He was 30 years old. And he was a thief because the drugs he killed himself with, he stole from the hospital pharmacy. And he was malignant dumb because after 14 years of medical school, he still couldn't read a syringe properly and he overdosed himself. I mean, even these high school dropouts that live in cardboard boxes don't kill themselves with drugs, right? They just go on and on and on like these pink rabbits. At any rate, <laughs> God works in mysterious ways and took him out of the loop for us. I mean, you wouldn't want him taking care of your kids or grandkids, would you? Uh, his nickname in medical school was the social director because he was the one who could always get the drugs and alcohol for the medical students. Now, you can always learn a lot from obituaries. That's another one of my hobbies is collecting obituaries. And, um, you know, you can learn what's going on in a community, how good the doctors are by reading obituaries in the community. And so um, this one fascinated me. Grace Mysterio, 48 years old, died of breast cancer. Not unusual, tragically, uh, but uh, certainly a waste of uh, humanity. But this little tale on the headline, given radiation as a baby, concerned me. So I read her obituary in detail, then took that information and went to the medical school and dug out some facts. And basically, when she was six months old, her pediatrician shrunk her thymus gland with radiation, high doses of radiation, because he felt it was too big. He didn't have any uh, yardstick to determine whether it was too big or too small. He just felt it was too big. A uh, large thymus gland just means you have a robust immune system. You want a large thymus gland. It begins to shrink the day you're born. You don't want a small one. And um, uh, between 1945 and 1950, every doctor in America could get his own little x-ray machine as an army surplus or military surplus for about 25 bucks. No instructions, no restrictions, no handbook. They just said, here, doc, here's your x-ray machine. Go x-ray them. And according to the Department of Energy, between 1945 and 1950, one million American babies had their thymus glands shrunk with radiation by pediatricians. One million American babies. Now, again, according to the Department of Energy, each and every one of these 
um, people have either already died of cancer or currently under treatment for cancer or are projected to get cancer because of the radiation they got in their chest to shrink their thymus glands. I want you to remember that not a single foreign enemy has ever radiated an American, either military or civilian. And here's one profession, let loose with x-ray machines, radiated one million healthy American babies. Trust me, my dear, I'm a doctor. Now, I wonder what the pupils looked like in the eyes of this surgeon that morning when this doctor uh, took off the normal breast and left the cancerous one on this woman in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I guarantee you that no sober surgeon could do that. They have an x-ray hanging on the wall of the surgery room. They have a wax, red wax pencil, you know, with a big arrow saying, that's the one, doc, you know. And if he's the sort of guy that's dyslexic, they put a red ribbon around his arm and say, take off that one. And so you know that this guy had to be gorked out on something. This one here was a neurosurgeon. He took the skull off his patient and began operating on the brain. And uh, he had the munchies, according to the article, had to run out for 25 minutes and uh, go eat something. I don't believe that's true, because I've done a lot of surgery. And even if you get hungry, you don't run out in the middle of an operation. I believe he was one of those 52% of the medical doctors who were on cocaine. And he was getting withdrawal symptoms and had to go snort something in the bathroom and recover before he went back. And he left the nurse with a Black & Decker drill drilling holes in this patient's head. <laughs> And she injured the patient, so he got his license suspended for 30 days. I mean, he's a doctor. He spent 14 years in school. He deserves to get his money back, right? This one here is kind of interesting. wonder what, his, uh, what, what this surgeon's uh, pupils look like. Uh, he was from the Osteopathic Medical Center of Texas, and he promptly removed the normal lung of a patient and left the cancerous one in. He settled for $9 million. Why didn't he go to court and fight it? <laughs> now, one of the basic things you'd like to see physicians learn in medical school is whether a patient is alive or dead. That should be basic training, right? <laughs> you'd like to think so. But you never know when you see stuff like this in the newspaper. Now, this gal was 86 years old, and she was found cold, stiff, and blue in her, her um, nursing home apartment. And, and, of course, the doctor there came up and couldn't find her pulse on just a, a simple examination. He said, oh, look, she's 86 years old. Let's let her slip away quietly. Let's not do anything heroic here and run up the cost for the family. So they called the coroner's wagon. They hauled her body off to the hospital in the local area. And the house doctor is not going to let you put a body into the uh, hospital morgue unless there's a death certificate. So he comes down, he examines her, he couldn't find the pulse, he says, okay, she's dead, writes a death certificate, they strip her down, hose her body down, put her in a body bag and put her in a freezer for 90 minutes until the coroner gets there to do an autopsy. They wheel her out after 90 minutes in the freezer, zip open the body bag and she sits up and says, oh, thank God you found me, it was cold and dark in there and I didn't know where I was. <laughs> Now, she had to be a tough old bird. <laughs> you try hosing yourself down, getting naked in a freezer for 90 minutes and see how well you do. <laughs> now, do you think those doctors really cared about her? Now, this guy was famous. Uh, Willie King at the uh, University Community Hospital in Tampa, Florida. Uh, he had gangrene of his right leg. And he went into the hospital to get his right leg amputated because he had uncontrolled diabetes. And of course, when you have gangrene, the meat stinks like rotten meat in the garbage. I mean, you can't miss it. The skin is slipping off and bones are showing through and it's a real mess. And the surgeon promptly amputated his normal left leg. I mean, even a Cub Scout wouldn't do that. And so um, I know that he was gorked out on something. A couple more here and we'll get into the concept number two. I know that's why you're here. But I think you have to know this stuff so you really pay attention to concept number two. Uh, medical student arrested for illegal sale of weapons. I don't believe that he made a habit of selling guns to street gangs like he was caught for. I believe he was one of the 78% of the medical students who were doing cocaine and the street gangs blackmailed him and said, hey, if you don't buy us some guns, we'll tell people you're using cocaine and you'll never practice. So I'm glad he's out of the loop too. Another one of those very moral, high uh, uh, ethical medical people. A couple more here. Insurers are now getting swamped with disability claims by doctors. These are doctors who have sold their practices to HMOs. Now, when they're in private practice, they gross $50,000 to $100,000 a month. And, of course, they get to play with the money. If they're a specialist like a cardiologist or an orthopedic surgeon, they gross a quarter of a million or half a million dollars a month. And um, what they do, of course, is uh, if they want to buy a Mercedes, 
they don't pay interest on it for 10 years. Uh, they just take a late payment on their house, uh, pay 10% for a late fee, and they plop down $100,000 on a Mercedes, and they get to play with that money. Now, once they sell their practice to an HMO, the HMO keeps all that money, have to pay the nurses and the insurance and all the uh, gloves, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And the doctor gets a paycheck, $10,000 a month. Now, to you and me, that sounds like a lot of money, but to an orthopedic surgeon, that's sticker shock. And he kind of says, oh my God, what did I do here? And uh, then he starts looking at the benefits. Why did I become an employee of this HMO? And he learns that his disability check is going to be $20,000 a month. And he figures, why should I practice and risk losing my house and my car from uh, you know, a malpractice suit, work hard, get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, do surgery, when all I have to do is, oh, got a back problem here. And it's real easy to get a golf buddy to say he blew a disc, and suddenly now he can collect $20,000 a month. And that's what's happening now. These doctors are so used to stealing money from patients and insurance, there was no big mental leap for them to do that. Last one, concept number one, why you need to take care of yourself and how to avoid the landmines, is this trust gap that's between doctors and patients. Everybody knows that uh, doctors treat the symptoms rather than getting down to the root cause of things. That's no secret. And, and some of the greatest cartoons today about doctors, you see this little granny going into a doctor's office and she's got law books and a PDR and a uh, Merck manual and she's got a big thug with her to beat up on the doctor and a lawyer and all this sort of stuff. And uh, so you know that there's this trust gap and doctors know this. And my daddy, when I grew up on the farm, he'd say things to me like, Joel, if you do anything in this community, if, if you make anybody in this community feel that we're liars or we're dishonest, I will personally burn you at the stake. Now that made an impression on me when I was a kid. Because I know what roasted marshmallows look like and I didn't want to be burned at the stake. And so I mean, even on Halloween, I never dumped over outhouses. I was very careful. Uh, but, and I would like to see ethics professors in medical schools tell their medical students, look, if you do anything to a patient, if you cheat a patient, if you're dishonest with a patient, I will personally come to your practice and strangle you to death. I would like to see them say things like that, but they don't. Here's what's happening in medical schools. Doctors are now urging, or medical professors are now urging medical students to take acting lessons so they can convince patients they love them. Instead of getting down to the root cause of things and just being honest, they're learning how to act so they, so they can convince you how to, that, that they love you. Okay, that's concept number one. Those are all the reasons why you want to take control of your own health. And I'm really uh, genuinely so happy to see so many people here who are interested in information in their own health. Now, concept number two, once you've survived long enough for concept number two to kick in, what you have to do is give your body all of the 90 essential nutrients every day that it needs to maintain and repair itself. Uh, we need 60 minerals, we need 16 vitamins, we need 12 essential amino acids, 3 essential fatty acids, and uh, they're called essential nutrients because each and every one of them um, are required every day to prevent one or more diseases. On the average, about 10 diseases per nutrient. And there's 90 essential nutrients times 10 diseases. That's 900 diseases that you can prevent and theoretically reverse with nutrition. That, to me, is very spectacular. The second part of the definition of something that's essential is your body cannot make it. And so you must eat it every day. You must take it in every day. Now, the media knows you're interested in health and nutrition. That's why 90% of you are here, because you heard our interviews on the radio. And it doesn't matter whether it's radio or TV or newspapers or magazines. Everybody's talking about health, low cholesterol diets, low fat diets, high fiber diets, uh, eat five pounds of broccoli a day, all that kind of stuff, right? Well, my favorite article of all time from the media, from the hard press anyway, uh, what they call hard ink, uh, is Time Magazine, The Real Power of Vitamins. New research shows they may help fight uh, heart disease, cancer, and the ravages of aging. The first time that the, the subject of vitamins and minerals and supplementation was in fact um, talked about in a positive way for the uh, um, American people <clears throat> in a mainstream publication. Again, The Real Power of Vitamins, new research shows it may help fight cancer, heart disease, and the ravages of aging. There were six positive pages in that article, and if you haven't read it, I'd urge you to go to a public library, a school library, and get it. Um, there was only one negative sentence that was given, as you might expect, by a medical doctor who was asked by the writer of the article, what do you think about vitamins and minerals as supplements for human nutrition? Here's what this medical doctor said, quote, Popping vitamins doesn't do you any good, sniffs Dr. Victor Herbert, a professor of medicine at New York City's Mount Sinai Medical School. We get all the vitamins we need in our diets, and taking supplements just gives you expensive urine, unquote. 
Now, a Missouri translation of that is you're just peeing away your money if you take vitamins and minerals. <laughs> you might as well take your dollars, throw them in the toilet, and flush them away because you can get everything you need from your four food groups. That's what he was trying to say. Now, I can tell you, after having done those 17,500 autopsies and over 454 species of animals, plus 3,000 human beings, practicing in a general family practice for 12 years up in Portland, Oregon, and... Um, pushing 60 myself and having kids this big and grandkids this big and not too distant future great-grandkids, I'd rather pee out 50 cents or a dollar a day worth of excess vitamins and minerals because it's a cheap insurance. It's a cheap investment in yourself to keep yourself healthy. And if you don't invest 50 cents to a dollar a day in yourself, as sure as God made little green apples, you're going to invest in the lifestyle of a medical doctor. Because when you pay that doctor bill, not one penny of that, you know, whether it's out of your own pocket directly, I think I got some change in here, yeah out of your own pocket directly or indirectly through insurance or indirectly through being taxed so you can pay Medicare and Medicaid and then have them pay the doctor, not one single penny of that goes to uh, better understand, manage, prevent, cure uh, catastrophic diseases in kids or um, breast cancer in women, prostate cancer in men, diabetes, heart disease. It doesn't do any of that. It simply pays the doctor's mortgage. You pay the doctor bill after the second week of the month, you're paying his Mercedes payment. You pay the doctor bill after the third week of the month, you're paying for the uh, tuition for his kids to go to medical school at Havid up in Boston. Worse yet, he might even be Yale Law School. That's all we need is some more Yale lawyers running around. We got two of them in the White House and you see what's going on there. <laughs> Now, I believe that the medical profession, I believe that the medical profession should, in fact, give people information on a free basis because they're the only profession, the only trade that we have guaranteed will not fail. You ask your employer to take half the insurance premium out of your paycheck, okay, and you argue, you know, as a union, you, you, you um, try and get them to pay this uh, uh, insurance premium to make sure the doctor gets paid. You don't do that for farmers or cops or uh, butchers or carpenters or plumbers. You only do that for doctors. And you beg your government to tax you to death so that they can pay Medicare for you. You don't do that for cops or farmers or anybody else. You only do that for doctors. So at the very least, I believe the medical profession owes the American public some information. Now, how many of you get two-cent photocopies from newspapers and scientific articles from your doctors every week or every month showing you positive things you can do from your medical doctors? Isn't that amazing? No hands up. Okay. I'll show you what I give my patients every week and every month so you know what you should be getting. Number one, if you take home nothing more than what I'm going to show you here in the next three slides, it will, will have been worth your coming here tonight. Let's just start out with cancer. It's the number two killer of Americans. And of course, the war on cancer was declared in 1971 by Nixon, and Congress agreed that the American government should uh, jump in and deal with this terrible disease, and they committed $23 billion to uh, finding a cure and a vaccine for uh, cancer. And over a period of 24 years, uh, finally they were called up before Congress to give a progress report. They said, okay, what did you do with our $23 billion? What have you done over 24 years? And they said, well, unfortunately, the rate of cancer has gone up in America since 1971 by 18%. And we spent your $23 billion, but we don't have any vaccines or cures. But that's because we were in the wrong position. We weren't positioned right. And what we want now is we want a medical doctor in the president's cabinet. We want him to be called the cancer czar. And we want his office to have $60 million a year so he can fly around the country and tell people it's better to take chemotherapy and radiation so it'll reduce the uh, cancer death rate. Well, I'm glad we have a conservative Congress in there right now because they're going to tell these doctors where to shove that request because the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over again and expect a different outcome. Now, we've been doing chemotherapy and radiation for 30 years, and the rate of cancer has gone up 18%. Now, what they say is, well, we've been doing it only during the daytime. Now we want the money so we can try it at night for 23 years. <laughs> now, I don't want you to wait for your government or don't even wait for your doctor to give you permission to do this thing for cancer. If you do this, you start it tonight, and you will save yourself an enormous amount of money and unnecessary misery. This is the real answer for cancer. This study was done by the National Cancer Institute, not the National Enquirer. We're talking about the most highly funded research agency in the world. And uh, they not only get money from Americans, but they get money from governments from all over the world because everybody, in fact, is terrified of cancer. And what they did was go to Henan Province, China. They went to Henan Province, China, and they chose there to do their study because it has the highest rate of cancer in the whole world. 
and they took 29,000 people over a period of five years between the ages of 40 and 69. They gave them different vitamins and minerals and, and combinations of vitamins and minerals into little groups to determine uh, if this had any positive effect on reducing the rate of cancer in this place that has the worst cancer rate in the whole world. To make a long story short, when they gave single nutrients, not much happened. Remember, Linus Pauling took 10,000 milligrams of vitamin C every day for 35 years, still died of cancer. And so you shouldn't be too surprised when they gave double the American RDA, which is 120 milligrams of vitamin C every day for five years, it didn't affect the rate of cancer. Uh, vitamin A or retinol didn't affect the rate of cancer. Zinc, riboflavin, the trace mineral molybdenum, niacin, none of those things affected the rate of cancer in Henan province. But one group did show significant benefit. This group got three nutrients. Uh, even though it was pitifully small doses, just double the American RDA, they got beta carotene, vitamin E, and the trace mineral selenium every day for five years. They showed significant benefit. They reduced the death rate from all causes. Deaths from all causes were reduced by 9%. That included diabetes and stroke and heart disease and cancer and accidents and suicide and so on. They reduced the cancer death rate by 13%. When you just looked at cancer, and the type of cancer that was most common in Henan province, China, stomach and esophageal cancer, they reduced by 21% just by giving 20 cents a day worth of three nutrients. You add up 21%, they got better, and 18% we got worse, that's 39% better off they are than we, just simply by taking 20 cents a day worth of three nutrients. Any of you get that notice from your doctor or your government? Or Okay. So I urge you to do this on your own. Don't wait for permission from anybody. Now my favorite disease, and, and the reason why many of you are here tonight, is arthritis. Arthritis affects 75% of all Americans over the age of 50, and there's not a single medical treatment designed to fix it. And I find that fascinating. Any disease that affects 70% of the people over age 50 in America, and there's no, no treatment designed to fix it, tells me that somebody's got their head in the wrong place. There must not be any money in fixing it. <clears throat> At any rate, uh, for 25 years, I've been giving my patients what I call Dr. Wallach's pig arthritis formula. And I'm going to give you that complete formula in just a minute. But uh, right now, I'll just tell you that Dr. Wallach's pig arthritis formula has regrown cartilage for thousands and thousands of people, even though it can't be done. This was the professor of medicine, the guy who was in charge of this study. He said, quote, after three months, it was clear that the drug was beneficial, unquote. Instead of saying, well, that Wallach was right. This stuff really works. Instead, he turned it into a drug in 90 days because uh, you can patent drugs. He had little sugar plums dancing through his head, cha-ching, cha-ching. Took him off of all their medication. They gave him a heaping tablespoon full of ground-up chicken cartilage in their orange juice every morning for 90 days. In 10 days, they had complete relief of pain and inflammation in just 10 days, something they hadn't had in 15 to 20 years. In 30 days, they could open up a new pickle jar without pain to the fingers, wrist, elbows, and shoulder. In 90 days, 28 out of the 29 had a complete clinical cure, according to Harvard Medical School. Now, here's the part that I find fascinating. This is where the medical profession really shows their colors. Now they charge $3,500 a month for little capsules of chicken cartilage in Harvard Medical School. So if you don't want to contribute to the delinquency of a medical doctor, all you have to do is go to Kentucky Fried Chicken, buy a $5 bucket of chicken, throw away the meat, and eat the ends off the bones. You get just... <laughs> And if you have several people in your family that have uh, arthritis, yeah, it could get a little pricey buying $5 buckets of chicken. Uh, you could take your grandkids or kids in the dark of the night with five-gallon uh, empty feed buckets, go to the dumpster behind the KFC, let them scoop out all those chicken bones for you, take them home, put them on a cookie sheet, put them in the oven and bake them dry, take your ball-peen hammer, mash them into a flour, fill those capsules yourself. But don't let your neighbors or friends or relatives know what you're doing <laughs> because if you let it get out, the FDA is going to come arrest you for manufacturing pharmaceuticals without a license, or even worse yet, Janet's going to come save you from yourself and burn your house down. <laughs> so if that seems a little messy for you illegal or you, or you don't want to mess with those gushy chicken bones, all you have to do is go to a grocery store, a good pharmacy, or a health food store and get some Knox gelatin, K-N-O-X. And most ladies know about Knox gelatin because it's good for the split ends on their hair and the brittle fingernails and skin quality. And I'm going to give you that complete formula in just a minute, but uh, right now I'll just tell you that Dr. Wallach's pig arthritis formula has regrown cartilage for thousands and thousands of people, even though it can't be done. Now, Alzheimer's is another one. Um, we didn't have Alzheimer's disease 2,000 years ago. Otherwise, it would have been the eighth plague that Moses laid on the Pharaoh, right? I mean, it's a terrible disease. 
um, we didn't have it 100 years ago. We only began to see Alzheimer's disease in America after the Second World War when we switched from butter to margarine. This is a doctor, a physician-caused disease. Alzheimer is a physician-caused disease because they've urged everybody to give up butter and go to margarine. And I'll prove this to you in a minute. Now, we learned how to prevent and cure 65% of the Alzheimer's disease in animals 50 years ago. Can you imagine a dairy farmer with 500 head of dairy cows way out in the pasture, and he's shaking the feed bucket and yelling to them, you know, you, oh, and the cows are out there scratching their heads saying, why do we want to go to the barn? <laughs> and if we did, where is it? <laughs> now, you'd have to pump gas into the ATV and run out there and get them, run the price of milk out. And so we learned how to prevent Alzheimer's disease and cure it in livestock, just for those reasons. And we did this with a low vegetable oil diet that's rich in vitamin E and selenium. Now, most people at this point say, now, come on, Wallach, now, we stuck with you with a cancer thing uh, with vitamin E and selenium and beta carotene, because we heard that before. It was no big surprise. And although we never heard this cartilage thing um, with arthritis, it makes sense. Give the body the raw materials, and it'll rebuild itself. But aren't, aren't you kind of um, pushing a little bit here? Aren't you stretching it with this vitamin E thing and, and Alzheimer's? I mean, uh, Ralph Nader says it's the fourth leading cause of death in Americans over the age of uh, 65 now. It went from zero 50 years ago to now it's the fourth leading cause of death in seniors over age 65. I mean, could it really be nutrition? Well, you should have gotten a, a two-cent photocopy of this news release or the scientific paper from your doctors uh, three years ago, July 1992. This is from the University of California at San Diego School of Medicine, not from the National Enquirer. Vitamin E can ease memory loss in Alzheimer's victims. How many of you got that notice from your doctor? Nobody. Remember, the doctors own 51% of the stock in the nursing home that takes care of Alzheimer's patients. My personal pet peeve is birth defects. We're able to prevent 98% of all birth defects in animals, and we do this with what we call preconception nutrition. It's so effective, we're even able to prevent birth defects that are considered to be genetic in humans. We can prevent Down syndrome, cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophy, heart defects of all kinds, club limbs, missing limbs. Uh, hernias, biochemical defects such as epilepsy and PKU and other things like that. We prevent 98% of these in animals with, uh, with what we call preconception nutrition. We give the female animal for 60 to 90 days before they conceive, before AI or before um, uh, natural breeding. Uh, we give them uh, all these vitamins and minerals and trace minerals and essential amino acids and fatty acids. So when the embryo begins to develop, it begins to develop immediately in optimal nutrition. In humans, we wait till the woman misses one or two or three menstrual periods. She then goes to the OB and gets the blessing. Yes, my dear, you're pregnant. Now you may have your prescription for prenatal vitamins and minerals. Now the human brain, spinal cord, heart, and other major organs form in the first 28 days of pregnancy. If the woman gets the prenatal vitamins and minerals at the 30th day or the 45th day or the 60th day, does it protect the embryo in any way? No. Absolutely not. And as a result, the birth defect rate in America, this was just published two months ago by the University of California, San Francisco, the birth defect rate in America now is one out of 33 babies in America is born with some kind of defect, either physical, emotional, or mental. One out of 33. And if you look at animals that receive pellets or cake that have vitamins and minerals and trace minerals in it, the birth defect rate in those animals receiving commercial or, or prepared diets is one out of 500,000 compared to one in 33 for humans. Now, you should have gotten this notice, especially you ladies who go to OBs uh, three years ago. The CDC, Center for Disease Control, came out and said that women who are sexually active, whether they plan a pregnancy or not, should be taking vitamins and minerals so that if a pregnancy does occur, the embryo is immediately protected. For 40 bucks a pregnancy, we can prevent 98% of all birth defects and all the human misery that goes along with it. Okay, let's change pace a little bit. I want to ask you some questions. How many of you have ever heard that vegetable oils are healthier for you than that terrible saturated animal fat? Whether you believe it or not, how many of you have heard it? Good, that's pretty good. Then this group's about 70%. The other 30% are either asleep, lying, or have Alzheimer's. Because I, I know you've heard it. I know you've heard it. Now, we knew 50 years ago in the animal industry that vegetable oil was dangerous because we tried to get animals to gain weight faster by giving them 20% of their calories in their rations, uh, corn oil or soil, because uh, oil and fat has nine calories per gram compared with carbohydrate or cracked corn has four and a half calories per gram. Uh, the more calories per mouthful, the faster the animals would get out of the feedlot. Less labor, less feed, and more profit for the farmers. And it was a good theory to look at. 
But uh, for the first couple of weeks, these animals getting corn oil or soy oil in their ration did gain weight much faster than the ones without it. But at six weeks, they all died of heart attacks. So we knew it was a good idea that went sour somewhere along the line. And they said, what do we do now? We've contracted with farmers to grow millions of tons of soy oil and corn oil uh, each year for the next 25 years. And no farmer's dumb enough to give this stuff to his livestock. So what do we do? And one guy popped up and said, well, it's not proven in humans yet. We'll just convince people it's good for them until it's proven otherwise. Well, that was 35 years ago. And the news came out three or well, two and a half years ago said the vegetable oils can cause heart disease. It's a nightmare, said Dr. Edward Emkin, a specialist in food oils for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It's really a nasty thing when you try to explain it. There's now total confusion for consumers. Why would there be confusion? Because the truth is different from what you've been taught. Now, here's another look at the same problem. A little over two years ago, this was a study that was done by Harvard Medical School and was called the Harvard Nurses Health Study. They took 90,000 nurses, divided them up into two groups. Half of them, 45,000 nurses, they made them use butter as their spread on their crackers and bread and cooking shortening. The other half, the other 45,000, they made them use margarine as their spread on their crackers and bread and, and cooking shortening. And after 20 years, they looked at the nurses who had died of a heart attack, and for every 100 nurses who had died of a heart attack, 70 of them were in the margarine group two and a half times greater risk of dying of a heart attack if you use margarine. How many of you got that from your doctor? The, the USDA actually sent that around to all doctors. Now, I, I typed a PS on there from me to my patients, and I said, look, because of this, what I want you to do is box up all your margarine, your salad dressings, your cooking oil, and ship it to a communist. Not only will it save... <laughs> I mean, not only will it save American lives, but it's more effective than bullets. <laughs> And you know, I don't have a single patient today that uses margarine. Now, one of my favorite parts of the survey is down here. It said, those nurses just, uh, who ate um, just two cookies a day made with margarine instead of butter had a 50% higher risk of dying of a heart attack. Just two cookies a day. And if you're a cookie eater, you can't just eat two cookies a day. I know. I mean, I did a lot of research when I was a teenager. <laughs> And I know that it takes at least a dozen cookies to get that sweet sludge in the bottom of that glass of milk. <laughs> now, one of the greatest pieces of medical fraud that's ever been perpetuated against the American public is this cholesterol thing. Last year, Americans spent $117 billion for cholesterol testing. $117 billion just for cholesterol testing, and it didn't extend the American longevity by 30 seconds. They have us so paranoid about cholesterol. Most men know their cholesterol levels, but they don't remember their anniversary date. <laughs> now, how many of you ever had your doctor tell you what your body uses cholesterol for? Okay, because we use it for 25 essential functions in our body. If you don't eat it, your body makes it. And that's the only reason it's not classed as an essential nutrient, like calcium and zinc and copper and vitamin A and B vitamins. We need it for 25 essential functions, but we make some of it. And because we make some of it, it cannot be classed as an essential nutrient, yet it really is. I'll just give you the top two. You can um, uh, ask your doctor. Why don't you ask your doctor about the other 23? That'll be real interesting. Uh, number one. 75% of your brain weight is pure cholesterol. 75% of your brain weight is pure cholesterol. It's called myelin. It's that fatty stuff. I remember on the farm, we didn't waste anything. we crack open the heads of sheep and pigs and cattle, and we'd eat the brains with eggs and things. Or if you've seen uh, uh, brains in a laboratory or anatomy lab or something like that in high school or college or professional school or tech school, you know that a brain is kind of fatty, soapy kind of thing. And the reason, of course, is 75% by weight, pure cholesterol. So if you give up animal fat and cholesterol in your diet, it's not your hips that go first, ladies. It's the old squash ola. <clears throat> now, the reason why I pick on ladies is because 85% of Alzheimer's patients are women. 85% of Alzheimer's patients are women. And if you look at a doctor's waiting room, 85% of the people in the doctor's waiting room are women and children. Men are either too smart or too dumb, I don't know, to go to doctors. And so you rarely see men going to doctor's offices. Now. When a woman gets in the, in the examining room and doctor says, uh, look, Francine, your blood cholesterol is too high. It's too farty. I want you to rip the chicken skin off the chicken before you eat it. And I want you to give up red meat. She'll say, yes, doctor. I want you to give up butter and go to margarine. Yes, doctor. I want you to give up eggs and go to egg beaters. Yes, doctor. And she'll leave there and she'll go home and she'll kill everybody in the family doing that. I mean, she will follow that down to the letter. Now, when a man hears that same lecture, he starts getting this palsy and starts shaking a little bit. 
and he goes outside of the doctor's office and has a hold onto the wall and he says, how, how do I recover from this? I know, I'll go out and eat a 72 ounce steak. Yes, yes. <laughs> and that's why 85% of the Alzheimer's patients are women because women tend to listen to doctors more than men do. Now, so here's a case where being stupid <laughs> actually helps. <laughs> So if you want to avoid getting Alzheimer's disease, what you want to do is eat your 90 nutrients every day, supplement with your 90 nutrients, um, give yourself the raw materials to manufacture the myelin or the cholesterol stuff in your brain, and you want to eat two eggs soft scrambled every morning in butter. You want to eat red meat at least twice a day. I can tell you what I ate tonight. I had beef ribs and pork ribs, and I mean, I eat meat. My, my motto, my personal credo is a day without a hamburger is like a day without sunshine. Because I refuse to get Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> Now, if you don't take your husband out to pig out in Big Macs at least once a week, you're making a mistake. Now, number two, number two is the sex hormones. We make sex hormones out of cholesterol. It's the basic building block to make sex hormones. You ladies make estrogen out of cholesterol. And if you give up uh, animal fat and cholesterol trying to make your doctor happy, you're going to be one miserable puppy going through menopause. Okay? Let me tell you, your own adrenal glands and your own liver will produce enough estrogen if you give it all the raw materials, the 90 nutrients plus cholesterol, where you'll just sail through menopause without any problems. You won't get the night sweats and the emotional roller coasters and the hot flashes and all the other terrible symptoms of menopause. If you just eat some cholesterol and take in the 90 nutrients. Now, when you go to your doctor and he tells you to give up cholesterol and uh, he'll give you estrogen supplements, you know, the patch or the pill or the shot, uh, in reality, he should scream at you until the blood vessels bulge out in his neck because using estrogen supplements increases your risk of breast and uterine cancer by 78%. By 78%. And it's really criminal for them to recommend estrogen to women. However, they do it all the time. Cha-ching. Now, if you want to avoid all the problems that go along with estrogen supplementation, all you have to do is eat two eggs, soft scramble every morning in butter, eat some red meat uh, every day. Don't rip the chicken skin off the chicken before you eat it. I mean, Cleopatra never did that, and she never complained about menopause, right? <laughs> I mean, it would have been recorded in history if she'd been sitting there frantically ripping chicken skin off. Now, you men don't get off easy. You make testosterone or male sex hormone uh, out of cholesterol, and if somebody's trying to help you, like your government or your doctor or your wife or your kids or somebody saying, hey, Dad, you've got to give up all this cholesterol, um, after about two years on a low cholesterol diet, you won't know whether to lead or follow on the dance floor. You're going to be confused <laughs> as your station in life. And invariably, after these meetings, some gal gets me off to the side and says, Hey, Doc, uh, uh, you've got to help me. My husband hasn't been interested in the bedroom for the last ten years, and it's gotten so bad in the last year, he even watches TV after the national anthem goes off. <laughs> And I say, well, do you have him on a low cholesterol diet? And she slept through this part of the meeting, so she thinks I want him on a low cholesterol. She says, oh, yeah, I rip the chicken skin off before I give it to him. There's no red meat in our house, and we use margarine instead of butter, and we use egg beaters instead of eggs. And I said, well, there's your problem. You've turned him into a steer. <laughs> you might as well have used the old Berdizos on him. <laughs> So you want to get him back in the bedroom, dear, what you got to do is give him two eggs, sauce, ramble every morning in butter, throw him some red meat once in a while, and if you want to rip the chicken skin off of your chicken, give it to him. <laughs> and you'll know he's ready for the bedroom again when he starts pawing the rug and his eyebrows lift up. <laughs> now, as crazy as that sounds, I've had a thousand women come back to me and say, hey, doc, them eggs really work. <laughs> Now, you should have gotten these notices about cholesterol from your doctor about uh, two and a half years ago. Almost, no, it's almost three years. Next month, it'll be three years. This is from the University of California at San Francisco. And they, these experts on cholesterol and heart disease came out and said reluctantly, and they came out and reluctantly admitted that low levels of cholesterol are more dangerous for you than high levels of cholesterol. Human beings' cholesterol, well, look at this date here, August 11th, 1992 because uh, I'm going to show you the same study, just a different newspaper. The human being's cholesterol should be between 220 and 270. If your blood cholesterol is 270, it just means you're sexier than somebody that has a 200 cholesterol. And um, there's no difference in longevity between a 200 cholesterol and a 300 cholesterol. You know, she's saying, yes, mine's 300. Yes. <laughs> okay. I'll do it this way so you can see it. 
This is a very interesting comment from the director of that study, a professor of medicine from the University of California, San Francisco, Dr. Stephen Hulley, the world expert on cholesterol, and here's what he said, quote, remember, three years ago now. What it comes down to is there's an extraordinary set of observations that have, occur that have emerged this year because for the first time we have a large enough study to really see them. What he said there was that for 35 years we've been giving you misinformation. We didn't really know what we were talking about about cholesterol, and for the first time we have the real answer, is what he said. In this study of 350,000 middle-aged people, 6% of them had blood cholesterols below 180. These included vegans, people who didn't eat any animal products at all. It included people who had absorption problems, gallbladder and, and liver problems, so they couldn't absorb cholesterol even though they ate it. And then it included people who got prescription drugs like Mevacor and others to get their cholesterol down. They were prescribed by their medical doctors. And over 20 years, here's what they found out, that these people who had blood cholesterols below 180, they had a 200% increase in risk of dying of an intracranial hemorrhage or stroke, a 200% increase in risk. They had a 300% increase in risk of dying of liver cancer. They had a 200% increase in risk of dying of lung disease, such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, emphysema, asthma, and obviously it was many times worse than that if they smoked. They had a 200% increase in risk of being depressed and suicidal and killing themselves. And lastly, they had a 500% increase in risk of dying from an addictive process such as alcohol or drugs or smoking. Now, why would anybody want to have a blood cholesterol below 180? Well, because a doctor told you to do it. Just remember, these are the same bunch of guys who radiated one million American babies to shrink their normal thymus glands. They come up with all these cockamamie ideas that will kill you. Now, five years ago, when I started out on this lecture tour, I began lecturing 300 days out of each year for the last five years. And my wife and my mother said, look, we'll support you if you want to do something that crazy, but we're going to ask you to do a few things for us. And I said, okay, whatever you guys want to get that support, I'll do it. And the only thing they really asked me to do that was unusual was um, to have a hobby so that if I really got off the deep end and got excited where they were going to come after me with a butterfly net and haul me away, that I'd get this uh, hobby out of the briefcase, study it, and calm myself down. So I said, okay, that's fair. And I sat down and I started making a list of possible hobbies and I looked at uh, doing crossword puzzles. Well, that's good mental exercise, might help me, but didn't help anybody else. And so I went through a whole list of things, trying to find a hobby that would help other people, and I finally settled on collecting obituaries of doctors. <laughs> Now, as crazy as that sounds, it has a positive value. Because if doctors knew what they were talking about when it comes to health, nutrition, longevity, and that kind of thing, if you separate them out from the general population in America, they should be healthier and live longer, right? If they knew what they were doing. So I did that. I went to the medical library at the medical school at San Diego, at La Jolla, at the north end of town, and I spent a week in there going through all these statistics and the surveys that were done on causes of death in doctors and longevity studies and things. And what I found out was pretty shocking. The, the average lifespan for medical doctors in America is 58. 58. The average lifespan for the average person in America is 75.5. So you can gain 20 years statistically by not going to medical school. <laughs> I brought you a few of my favorites so you'd see what I'm talking about. Dr. Stuart Cartwright here, age 38, dropped dead in his home in San Diego from a ruptured coronary aneurysm, a swelling or a ballooning of the uh, artery in the heart. And of course, a aneurysm is a breakdown of the elastic fibers in the artery and you get a ballooning in that weakened area, much like a car or, or truck tire when you hit a chuck hole and you break the cords and you get a ballooning of that area, it's very weak and will blow. I always say that Dr. Stuart Cartwright here died of something even a turkey wouldn't die from because in uh, 1957 we learned from a turkey study what causes aneurysms. The USDA uh, felt that they knew enough about turkey nutrition at that time. They were able to take turkeys off of the range and put them on concrete or wire, and they, they built this pellet to do that. And in the first 13 weeks in this pilot project where they had 250,000 turkeys on it, in the first 13 weeks, farmers were out there every morning picking them up by the bushel baskets full, taking them to the um, state diagnostic lab to see what they died from. When they opened them up for the autopsy, every one of them, 125,000 of them, had died of a ruptured aortic aneurysm. And one of the clever pathologists says, you know, that's got to be due to a copper deficiency because copper is required to manufacture uh, elastic fibers and also maintain the strength in arteries and skin and other tissues in the body. So they doubled the amount of copper in there. And the next year they tried to raise 500,000 turkeys and not a single one of those turkeys died from a ruptured aneurysm. They went from a 50% loss to a zero loss just simply by doubling the amount of copper in there. They got very excited about this and they started co um, studying copper deficiency diseases in humans and varieties of species of animals. 
And again, to make a long story short, what they found out was this. The first symptom of a copper deficiency in human beings is white, gray, or silver hair. Even in the dark, I see a lot of copper deficiency in this room. Now, the medical profession would say, well, just color your hair. And we're going to treat the symptom, even though you have serious things going on on the inside. And if you don't take this warning, if you don't heed this warning from your body and don't start supplementing with some colloidal copper, what happens is you begin to get a breakdown of the elastic fibers in your skin and you get uh, crow's feet around the corners of your eyes and the corners of your mouth, parts of your anatomy begin to sag. And you know you're in trouble when you go to your doctor for a physical and he says, you know, I've got a golf buddy, <laughs> I mean a colleague down the hall here who's a plastic surgeon and for $10,000 he'll make you look 20 years younger. He can give you a facelift, a booby lift, a tummy tuck, a derriere lift. And you don't need any of that surgery. Really, all you need is some colloidal copper, and everything will come back up like you have a hydraulic jack under it. <laughs> now, if you don't do something about it at that point, you get a breakdown of the elastic fibers in the large veins of your legs, and you get varicose veins. And if you don't heed the warning there, you get a breakdown of the elastic fibers in your exhaust pipe, you get hemorrhoids. <laughs> so, so if you have hemorrhoids, varicose veins, uh, skin wrinkles or things that sag, gray, white, or silver hair, the odds are you have some aneurysms growing in you somewhere. And don't be one of these people who dies suddenly and all your friends get together at Denny's, you know, after the funeral, they're all still dressed up in their glad rags and they say, you know, we never would have thought that Frank would be the first one to go. I mean, this guy <clears throat> was Mr. Fitness. He jogged every morning, he belonged to the health club, went and did aerobics three times a week, he had his little bike at home, did his thing. He was a vegetarian. I mean, this guy was Mr. Fitness. He always looked so handsome, so distinguished in his gray hair. <laughs> now, another one of my favorites is Dr. Martin Carter. He's age 57, died one year before the average for physicians, and um, he was an expert, according to the New York Times obituaries. Now, he had every drop of medical education you could get in the whole world. Uh, let's see here. He uh, got his undergraduate degree, his pre-med stuff from Dartmouth College. Excuse me, Dartmouth. You can't say the R's up in New England. From Dartmouth College. He received his MD from Harvard up at Boston. And he got his PhD degree from medicine, in medicine from Yale. He had every drop of medical education you get in the whole world, but he didn't have expensive urine. <laughs> the cause of death was a ruptured aortic aneurysm, just like those copper-deficient turkeys. Now, this guy here, I have to give you a quick quote so you won't think ill of me before I show you his obituary. Clarence Darrow was very famous. He was kind of a F. Lee Bailey, a trial attorney back, a defense attorney back in the 20s, and he was made famous by a variety of trials, including the Scopes Monkey Trial in Tennessee. And the prosecutor who always fought him in court was William Jennings Bryant. Both of them were great orders, and they were always fighting each other in court and uh, on the lecture circuit and whatnot. And a week after that trial, William Jennings Bryant had actually won the trial. The prosecution won, and he died suddenly after that trial. And all the reporters and all the media ran, uh, ran and rushed to Clarence Darrow because they knew they had this blood feud between them. And he said, well, wow, you must have really been rough on uh, William Jennings Bryant because he just died just shortly after that trial. And Clarence Darrow knew this was the last chance he'd have to take a dig at his old buddy. And uh, he knew that if he died first, it would be the other way around. So this is a very famous quote. Here's what he said. Quote, oh, I hate to see anybody die, but there have been a few obituaries have enjoyed reading, unquote. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of how I feel about this guy. <laughs> Dr. Thomas Beam, age 48, died 10 years before the average for physicians, 30 years before the average for the average American on the street, he was an expert, according to the New York Times obituaries, and um, he died of a simple cardiomyopathy heart attack, a selenium deficiency, and not only was he an expert, he was an FDA expert. Why would you want to listen to anything the FDA had to say about health and nutrition when their experts are dying of a selenium deficiency disease at age 48? My mother's favorite obituary, and of course my mother's 76 years old, and she collects these things when I'm out on the road. She gets all these newspaper subscriptions from all around the Midwest. And when I get home, I always have this envelope, a plain brown envelope that says personal and confidential. And she's got, she's got obituaries of politicians, lawyers, and doctors in there. <laughs> I mean, she's expanded the theory, right? 
And so this is her favorite. Uh, Dr. Gail Clark, uh, 47, was not only a cardiologist, she was the chief cardiologist of her own hospital. And she was walking down the halls of her own hospital with her stethoscope. Hi, I'm Dr. Gail Clark, chief cardiologist. Here's my stethoscope. Boom! She dropped dead right there in the hospital. And all her colleagues, you know, they're screaming for code carts and residents and interns and house doctors. And everybody's trying to save Dr. Clark, the, the, the chief cardiologist. And they're trying to save her next to you. And you hear this, all this activity. And you hear him cutting the clothes off this patient in an emergency going on. And you hear him say, okay, bring up the paddles. Turn it on. Okay, put on contact gel. Everybody clear here. Clear everybody. Here we go. It didn't work, so they say, okay, turn it up to the next step, uh, more contact gel, clear everybody, <laughs> and they turn on the monitor. <laughs> so you hear, you know, the flat line, so you know they're dead, and your monitor's going beep, 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 because you're nervous, <laughs> you're a heart patient. And you say, nurse, nurse, what happened next door? I heard all this chaos and screaming and everything. And they say, well, you know, your cardiologist, the chief cardiologist of this hospital, Dr. Gail Clark, age 47, just croaked next door from a cardiomyopathy heart attack. You can see all the patients holding their gowns, and they're running out of the hospital as fast as they can go. <laughs> because whatever the chief got, they don't want. <laughs> I mean, man, if you can't save the chief with it, why would you want it? Now, you'd like to think that somebody who won the Nobel Prize in medicine would at least live to be the average of 75.5. This guy here was the youngest person ever to win the Nobel Prize in medicine. He was 38 years old. Excuse me, 37. 37 years old, won the Nobel Prize in medicine. 11 years later, he died of a cardiomyopathy heart attack, simple selenium deficiency disease. So I always tell people, whatever a doctor tells you, do the opposite and you'll live longer. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> now, remember my job when I came back from Africa was to find an early warning system. And I believe I found it. It's not an exotic animal like a koala bear, a wallaby, or anything like that, or a hummingbird, or maybe <clears throat> a... Um... Oh, we have a drug dealer in the group. <clears throat> <clears throat> he's either licensed or unlicensed, but he's a drug dealer. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a rare fish or a reptile. In fact, the early warning system that gives us a clue on what's going on in the world of, of health and nutrition is our young athletes. According to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, the Center for Disease Control, what you need to do <clears throat> is look at athletes. 100,000 of them die each year suddenly during exercise or immediately after exercise. 100,000, even though doctors say exercise is good for you. I began to see stuff like this over the last 10 years in medical journals, sudden death in young athletes, because it's gotten to be a real thing in the medical field. This is a small study, but it uh, gives you an idea of what's going on. 29 highly competitive, highly conditioned athletes between the ages of uh, 13 and 30 drop dead during exercise or immediately after exercise, and 35% of them died of ruptured aneurysms. What did they die from? Copper deficiency. The other 65% died of cardiomyopathy heart disease. They died of a selenium deficiency. And so this began 10 years ago to make me believe that athletes were giving us a story early on. You see this stuff in the newspapers all the time. This happens to be uh, from Colorado University in Boulder. And this is a kid, 22 years old, Darren Mallott, uh, had just signed a multi-million dollar contract with an NBA team. And uh, he died just while he was shooting some baskets. And I talked to the pathologist who uh, did the autopsy on him. He died of cardiomyopathy heart disease at age 22. <clears throat> Here's one that's very famous, Reggie Lewis. Reggie Lewis was 27 years old. He was the captain of the Boston Celtics. Uh, he was a $65 million contract athlete. And he collapsed in uh, April of 1993, a little over two years ago, and was diagnosed very quickly and very accurately with cardiomyopathy heart disease. And because he was a $65 million contract athlete, the Boston Celtics hired the top 12 cardiologists in the whole world, gave them a million dollars each to refer all their patients out to other doctors so they could devote their full time to saving Reggie. Because if Reggie died, they had to give $65 million to his widow. Now, not one of those doctors, not one of those doctors who were called the dream team of cardiology, they were called the dream team of cardiology because they were the top cardiologists in the whole world. Not one of them gave $50 of their million dollars to a, a medical student or a researcher to go to the medical library and ask the computer, what are all the known causes of cardiomyopathy heart disease? And if they would have done that, kind of like, you know, Star Trek, computer, what are all the known causes of cardiomyopathy? The computer would have said, the only known cause was determined in animals in 1957. It was proven in humans in 1972, 17 years later, and this uh, was published 
uh, in, in every medical journal in the world. It was a double-blind crossover study of 45,000 human subjects. And not one of them did that. Not one of them. Oh, I should tell you what, what the cause is. It's a selenium deficiency disease. It's the only known cause. And they didn't give Reggie 20 cents worth of selenium. And as a result, he died from his second cardiomyopathy heart attack three months later, July 28, 1993. Now, justice has a way of coming around. Remember the dream team of cardiology, and you know what's coming. A year and a half later, the captain of the dream team of cardiology, Dr. Thomas Nessa, age 48, boom, <laughs> dropped dead from cardiomyopathy in his own home, the same thing that Reggie died from a year and a half earlier. He didn't learn anything from a $65 million autopsy. Now, I'd have been embarrassed to put this in the newspaper if I was his family. It says, uh, Dr. Thomas Nessa, a member of the dream team of cardiologists who treated the late Boston Celtics Captain Reggie Lewis, died Saturday in his home, blah, 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 from the same thing. I mean, I would have just put a little thing in the classified ads that said, Tom died. <laughs> that would have been it. <laughs> I mean, this guy was no couch potato. He actually finished the Boston Marathon three times. Okay, just a simple selenium deficiency disease. This one's a happy story. Evander Holyfield, two years ago, was banned from boxing because he had cardiomyopathy heart disease, not the kind that kills you suddenly with a heart attack, but a slow muscular dystrophy or a wasting of the heart muscle. And uh, they didn't want him to die suddenly during a boxing match. And so we talked to his cardiologist and his internist about six months ago, and they gave him some selenium based on our discussions with them. And those of you who follow boxing know that about a month ago, he was back in the ring and won his first fight back in the ring because his electrocardiogram had come back to normal just by taking some selenium. So there are happy stories if you do something about it. Runners are notorious for dropping dead during exercise. Frank um, Brock here was a follower of Jim Fix. Jim Fix died at age 52 after five cardiomyopathy heart attacks. He was the guy that started the whole running craze. None of you would have running shoes on if it weren't for Jim Fix. And uh, Jim Fix was a vegetarian, didn't want to supplement with any vitamins and minerals because he wanted to prove that it was the running and the exercise and the jogging that got you to live to be 100. And when he died at age 52 after five cardiomyopathy heart attacks in the, his last year of life, when they did the autopsy on him, his arteries were as clean as a newborn baby's. But they forgot one technical detail. His heart was very dead. <laughs> kind of interesting. Now. Frank Brock, age 46, died one day before his 47th birthday, and his daughter said he was always the type of guy who took care of his body. He was such a careful eater, we were embarrassed to eat around him. Remember George Foreman? Hamburgers, 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 and he's still going strong. And all these tall, skinny guys uh, who uh, run all the time and don't eat meat don't make it. This guy here, Tom Dowling from... Uh, Kansas City, Missouri, was a world-famous uh, marathon runner, and he noticed, you know, he wore one of these monitors around his arm and had the little things in his ear so he could make sure his heart rate was above 100 all the time for this aerobic thing. And he noticed something after 25 years of running that his, he had an irregular heartbeat and he had a little um, heart palpitation. So he called up a cardiologist, made an appointment, told him what was happening. The doc said, okay, when you come in, plan on being here for a while because we're going to do a stress test. You know, that's where you have this electric uh, treadmill and they kind of raise the level up and, and you go to your max out and they do an electrocardiogram during all this. And they did this stress test on him and he died 30 minutes after the stress test from a cardiomyopathy heart attack. When the reporters asked the doctors, hey, how come he died in the doctor's office? The, reporter, the doctor said, runner's recent deaths need to deter exercise. We know exercise is good for you, even though 100,000 die every year during exercise. It's good for you because we say so. Now, the ex-champ, uh, Buster Douglas, who lost his heavyweight championship to, I believe it was Andrew, uh, Vander Holyfield, two years after he lost the championship, developed diabetes, brittle diabetes. And we know that diabetes is caused, adult onset diabetes, <clears throat> is caused by a deficiency of two trace minerals, chromium and vanadium. And we'll talk about that in detail in just a little minute here. <clears throat> the rate of brain cancer in America has gone up 700% in the last 50 years. And of course, uh, there's all kinds of athletes who die of brain cancer. Lyle Alzado, football player. Uh, last year, I think it was August, uh, Fred LeBeau, the founder of the New York Marathon, died of brain cancer at age 56. And then in November, of 1994, not too many, about eight months ago, I guess, Wilma Rudolph, the first woman to ever win three gold medals in track and field, died of brain cancer at age 54. And this has nothing to do with cellular telephones. In laboratory animals, we can create brain cancer in animals by giving them a deficiency of a trace mineral called gallium, G-A-L-L-I-U-M, gallium. 
You uh, give them plenty of gallium, you supplement gallium in their feed and give them a chemical that will cause brain cancer, you can't give them brain cancer. But you give them a gallium deficient diet and give them the same ke uh, chemical, they'll all get brain cancer. <coughs> Excuse me. So I believe that this increase in brain cancer in America is not due to cellular telephones. In fact, it is due to a gallium deficiency and our athletes are giving us the early clue. Now here's the bottom line. Here's the real clue telling us what's going on with our athletes and what, they're, what they are in fact um, giving us this early warning. This little study was very interesting. Talked about gymnasts in college and universities. As many as 62% of female college gymnasts suffer from anorexia. They get depressed, they don't eat, they're not hungry, and um, if you don't do something about it, they die. I used to see a lot of these little gals up in my practice because when I practiced up in Portland, Oregon, that was the time of Olga Corbett. Remember this little gal, I think, from Romania? And uh, she was the first gymnast to ever get perfect scores in all the events that they were in. And every parent in, in the Northwest, at least, that I knew of wanted to have their daughters be uh, Olga Corbett. I mean, she was the darling of the world at that point. And so I saw a lot of anorexia way back in those days in these little gals. I used to see dozens of them a month because uh, there was an athletic or a, a, gym, a gymnastic training center in just about every corner back then. And I did hair analysis on these little gals, and sure enough, they were all deficient, very severely deficient in a trace mineral called zinc. And they wouldn't eat, of course, instead of fighting them and arguing with them and sending pills home to their mothers I knew they were just going to flush down the toilet, I'd have them come in and I'd give intravenous minerals to these girls, including intravenous zinc. And in 10 to 14 days, they were back doing their gymnastics, they were eating, they were just great little gals, they weren't depressed anymore. And the mothers who took their daughters to counselors and shrinks, those little girls were counseled unto death. Many of you remember Karen Carpenter from the Carpenter Singing Group. She was 28, 30 years old, I believe, and she had anorexia, and she went all over the world looking for a shrink or a counselor that could help her with anorexia, and nobody gave her any minerals, and they counseled her unto death. Now, what could possibly be the common denominator between a 65-pound gymnast, a 250-pound boxing champion, seven-foot-tall basketball players, uh, huge football players, runners of all kinds? What could possibly be the common denominator? Well, they all sweat. And when they sweat, they don't just sweat out potassium. They sweat out all 60 essential minerals. And if you sweat out all of your uh, um, selenium, if you sweat out all of your selenium and don't replace it with supplementation, you're at high risk of dying of a cardiomyopathy heart disease. If you sweat out all of your copper and don't replace it by supplementation, you're at high risk of dying of a ruptured aneurysm. You sweat out all of your chromium and vanadium and don't replace it by supplementation, you're at high risk of dying of um, diabetes. You sweat out all of your gallium and don't replace it, you're going to get a brain cancer. You're, you're a teenage girl and you sweat out all of your zinc, you have a 62% risk of getting anorexia and dying. Now, you don't have to just sweat when you're an athlete. What if you're a farmer bucking bales every July and August? What if you're a woman going through menopause and you're sweating all night? What if you're a baker in the ovens or a welder or a steel maker and you sweat? If you don't replace those minerals by supplementation, you're high risk of dying from those horrible diseases. Now, what are some of the early warning signs of mineral deficiencies? And of course, that's a question I get asked all the time. Farmers know this. You've heard of pica and cribbing. This is where horses and cows will eat the fence rails and uh, they'll chew on half doors in the barns and they'll eat the feed box rather than the feed and so forth. And they eat dirt and wire and nails and rocks, shingles off of roofs and deer bones and all weird things you're not supposed to eat. And a good husbandman, a good farmer, a good rancher knows those animals are minerally deficient and they better scoop some minerals to them, otherwise they're going to have to rebuild the fence and the veterinary bills are going to go up and they'll lose them from hardware disease and all kinds of things. <clears throat> and so we've taken care of that in the animal industry. In human beings, it's a little more complex. Uh, kids kind of act like animals. They go out in the garden and eat dirt. They see a dig in the garden, you see them eating dirt and they may eat handfuls of sand in a sandbox. Uh, they're telling you they're needing some minerals. Many of them eat that stuff out of kitty litter boxes, not because it tastes good, but because they're seeking things to put in their mouth to try and uh, fill that craving that they have. And of course, uh, mom always picks up the kitty litter box and puts it on the counter where they prepare food. I never figured that one out yet. And then um, they smack little Frankie on the hand and say, now don't do that, dear, that's nasty. And then Frankie can't get the kitty litter box anymore, so he goes over and eats lead-containing caulking from around windows and lead paint, but he's still looking for something to satisfy this need for minerals. Now, adults are a little more complex because we're socialized, and we know if we eat the wooden legs off of furniture or door jams or stuff like that, they're going to come after you with a butterfly net, right? Frank is losing it. He thinks he's a beaver. He's eating wooden furniture. <laughs> <clears throat> So we've learned that we can do things that are socially acceptable if we eat chips and dips and we become Pepsi-holics and chocoholics and sugar-holics and have to have donuts every morning and eat chocolate and candy and so forth. 
Uh, I hear this all the time. And this is one of the reasons why America has a weight problem, because we're minerally deficient, and people tend to eat chips and dips and Pepsis and donuts and chocolate and things when they really are craving minerals. Of course, we already talked about the gray hair. <clears throat> Another uh, deficiency symptom, early warning, is uh, age spots or liver spots in your hands. That is, in fact, a selenium deficiency for people who are taking in a lot of vegetable oils. Talk more about that later if we have time. Lithium is one of my favorite uh, minerals because shrink thinks it's a drug. They think it's a drug that only they can prescribe. It's one of those 60 essential minerals that you need in your diet every day. And like any other essential nutrient, if you're deficient in lithium, you get diseases. And these include, of course, violent behavior, manic depression, suicidal behavior. You can be a violent criminal. Um, you can be addicted to drugs or alcohol. These are all symptoms of lithium deficiency. Now, I believe we should be putting lithium in our drinking water instead of chlorine and fluorine because uh, it's cheaper than cops and it works. You don't have to chase down every criminal and spend your tax money building new jails and things like that. Just put lithium in the drinking water. Now, you can detect a child who's four or five years old with a lithium deficiency just by looking at their coloring projects in church nurseries or um, kindergarten or first grade or maybe looking at the uh, coloring projects that are put on the walls at Denny's restaurants and grocery stores during holidays. <clears throat> you notice that here, this child, four years old, is scribbling all over the page, has no intent of, of coloring in the lines, and they pick weird colors. Okay, this child is obviously going to be a serial killer later on in life. And he's <laughs> deficient in lithium, and uh, he probably has Pop-Tarts and Sugar Frosted Flakes for breakfast, or maybe eight ounces of apple juice and things like that. And all you have to do is get these kids off of all sugar, natural and processed, no honey, no molasses, no apple juice, no grape juice, no Pop-Tarts, no Sugar Frosted Flakes, no syrups, uh, um, no Egos and uh, stuff like that, and, or Tang, that's another bad one. And give them uh, lithium, chromium, and vanadium as a supplement, and don't coach them on coloring in the lines. And, and three to six weeks later, same kid, without coaching, look at the heels and the boots, the boots, the gloves, the tail, the glow, the border on the feet, and the hat, and so forth, staying in the lines. If you don't take care of these kids at this point, they will be in trouble. They'll drop out of school. They won't learn how to read, write, and do math. They'll be a problem for themselves, their families, and their communities. Now, I used to see a lot of these kids in my practice because somehow all the shrinks in Portland, Oregon, used to lecture to the teachers. And the teachers, when they got a hyperactive kid or an ADD kid in their class, uh, just for kicks here, how many of you have ever seen a hyperactive kid or have one in your family? Raise your hand. Everybody in this room, okay? 25 years ago, there weren't any. And so all these shrinks would tell um, the teachers, look, if you get a hyperactive kid or an ADD kid in your class, all you have to do is get them on Ritalin and it'll calm them down. It won't disrupt the class. And I used to get parents come to me in tears and say, look, if I don't do this, they're going to go to social services and they'll declare me an unfit parent. They'll take the kid away and they'll put him on Ritalin anyway. So I developed a little test that judges loved. I said, okay, bring your kid in before breakfast in the morning <clears throat> and uh, bring the, the breakfast in in a cooler. Don't tell me what it is, but don't give it to him until I tell you to. So they bring little Frankie in, six years old, and they say, hey, Frankie, draw me an animal. And this was, of course, a what? What animal is this? A giraffe. Even though a six-year-old, you can tell, long neck, long legs, big spots, it's a very good giraffe for a six-year-old. And say, okay, give Frankie the breakfast. And it would be things like Pop-Tarts, a Tang, you know, the vitamin C source or supplement for astronauts, which is 99.9% .9 sugar, and yellow food coloring, all the good stuff. No wonder astronauts are messed up. At any rate, um, our sugar frosted flakes and honey and molasses and all that kind of stuff. And I say, okay, give him the breakfast. I come back in an hour and a half, and I say, okay, Frankie, draw me a giraffe again. Same kid, an hour and a half after he had a sugar breakfast, looks more like a schmoo with birthday candles on his nose, doesn't look like a giraffe anymore. And this is what the teacher was seeing, and this is what the mother was seeing. And so all he had to do was get Frankie on a real American breakfast. I mean, oatmeal and eggs and real orange juice, and supplement him with chromium, vanadium, and uh, lithium, and he could learn how to read and write and be a sociable little character and became number one in the class. Now, if you don't deal with this, when they're four, five, six years old, you begin to see things like this. This is a geographic tongue. They get ulcers on the tongue because they don't have enough vitamin B, zinc, and things like that. Uh, the kid is hyperactive, has learning disabilities. He's going to drop out of school when he gets to be a teenager. He's going to be experimenting with drugs and smoking, and he'll be a problem for everybody and himself. If you don't deal with it then, when they hit 12, 13, 14 years old, they start looking like this. I want you to go home tonight and look at your kid's eyes and look at the grandkid's eyes. Uh, these are allergic shiners. This kid wasn't physically abused. This kid has too much sugar in his diet, no chromium, vanadium, or lithium. Can't learn how to read, write, and do math. He's going to be a high school dropout. Going to be a real problem for the family and himself. 
If you don't deal with it then, when they hit 18 to 20 years of age, they look like Johnny here, you don't have to be a clinical psychologist to see that he's depressed. Look at the allergic shiners under his eyes, and you read about kids like this in the newspapers all the time. Uh, he asked Grandma for the car keys on a Friday night like this. Granny, I want to you know, cruise town, give me the car keys. I mean, when I was 16, I would have plowed the field without a tractor to get the car keys. I'd taken a spoon and done the whole field just to get the car keys. But um, today, these kids are different. Uh, he walks out to the garage, gets a baseball bat, comes back in, wham, knocks grandma's head off, picks up the car keys, goes, cruises town. Two o'clock morning, comes back, he kind of kicks her. Yeah, she's stiff and dead, you know. So he puts a gun in his mouth and blows his head off. And you read about this in the newspaper the next morning. It says, teen goes berserk bludgeons grandma to death autopsy fails to reveal the presence of drugs that's the key sentence autopsy fails to reveal the presence of drugs you see this all the time these are teenagers who are gorked out on sugar they've been on pepsi and ding dongs his whole life and has not been supplemented with chromium vanadium and lithium now when i grew up on the farm we actually carried sidearms when we were working in the field because we had groundhogs and things like that rooting up the fields and uh, we had 22s you get a little older you get a 38 you get a little older you got a 357 right <laughs> and when I got to, to be about 20, I carried a 44 Magnum. Boy, I was tough. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, th them groundhogs didn't have a chance. Just the echo would get them. <laughs> <laughs> and we carried a 22 and a shotgun, things like that. We had these little saddle sheaths, you know, on the tractor. And uh, we thought we were big stuff. And, and we had the poisons we could kill predators and, and uh, uh, pest with. And we had machetes and, and pitchforks. And we had machines we could grind people up with and spread them on the field and plow them in. Nobody could ever find them. But we were good Christian kids. We didn't do stuff like that. Even though we had all this stuff at our, our um, uh, beck and call, we didn't do stuff like that. But today you see things like this in the newspaper all the time. Or a 14-year-old boy, Eric Smith from New York, clubbed a little 4-year-old to death with a 32-pound rock just to see what death was. And Eric Smith, two years before this, before he murdered this little kid, was diagnosed by his personal shrink as having intermittent explosive disorder. And so his defense attorney tried to get him off as being uh, innocent by reason of temporary insanity. Now, intermittent explosive disorder, 50 years ago when I was a kid, we used to call it throwing a tantrum. Now, my dad could cure intermittent explosive disorder <laughs> in about three seconds. All he had to do was start fiddling with his belt and saying, uh-huh, uh-huh, and man, I was cured of intermittent explosive disorder. But today, because uh, the average American eats 148 pounds of sugar every year, and some of you are eating 300 pounds because I don't eat any, which one of you is going to be the Jeffrey Dahmer? I don't know. <laughs> um, at any rate, um, because we have this problem, you're seeing more and more and more of this. And in the next 10 years, the prediction is we're going to see a huge epidemic of violence, not from old, hardened criminals, but from teenagers. This wasn't around 25 years ago, attention deficit disorder, but now it's uh, on the cover of Time magazine because so many families are broken up. One or both of the individuals, uh, adults in the family, have attention deficit disorder. Or the people lose jobs. They become antisocial. They become alcoholics and drug addicts because of their personal emotional problems. And all they have to do is get off of sugar. No Pepsis, no Ding Dongs, no honey, no molasses, no apple juice, no grape juice, no processed or normal or natural sugar in any way, and get supplemented with chromium, vanadium, and lithium. Now, this little gal here, 300 years ago, would have been a vampire or a werewolf. She would have been burned at the stake by her own fellow villagers, or maybe the, the head of the village would have killed her by driving a stake through her heart as everybody held her down. Her name was Susan Smith. Uh, she drowned her two sons uh, not too long ago. I got to know, April of uh, this year. And uh, we've learned a lot about her since she killed those two boys. In high school, she tried to kill herself twice, tried to commit suicide twice in high school. She had a lithium deficiency in high school. Five years out of high school, she was diagnosed with manic depression, and she was given the wonder drug Prozac instead of the nutrient lithium. I guarantee you, on the night before she drowned those two boys and killed them, she didn't uh, have a good eight hours of sleep, wake up in the morning, and have oatmeal and eggs for breakfast. This gal spent that night running around from 7-Eleven to 7-Eleven, maybe went to a few taverns looking for her boyfriend, drinking 32-ounce gulps and whatnot. And she was gorked out that morning when she drowned those two boys. I mean, she was trying to be logical. She says, well, my boyfriend doesn't like the kids, and so the only way I can have my boyfriend is to get rid of the kids. Another vampire, or werewolf, 300 years ago, Winetta Hoyt, was a great farm wife during the day, vacuumed the rug, did the laundry, took care of her kids. By night, she, drowned, uh, she smothered them to death with a pillow. Every time they get six to nine months old, she smothered them to death with a pillow. And in the story, she was diagnosed with... Um, 
uh, depression, lithium deficiency. She had diabetes, which is a chromium and vanadium deficiency. She has gray hair, which is a copper deficiency. She has a receding hairline, much like a male pattern baldness, which is caused by a tin deficiency, T-I-N, tin deficiency. See, all the women writing that down for their husbands. <laughs> She also uh, doesn't have any teeth in her mouth, which is osteoporosis, doesn't have any calcium, magnesium, boron, strontium, and other minerals. She has a goiter, which is an iodine deficiency. She has no less than eight mineral deficiencies, and it's no wonder. She probably watched Oprah all day and ate ding-dongs and chocolate and things like that, and so you, you can understand why she was hearing voices telling her to send her kids to heaven, because it wasn't nice on earth. Last one, before we get down to the final stages here, and then we'll open it up for personal health challenges. This guy here, I would have loved to have seen his uh, four-year-old coloring projects because I could have diagnosed him as a serial killer when he was four years old. He was caught eating road kills when he was four years old sitting on the edge of a state highway in Indiana. When he was seven, he was thought to be part of a satanic cult because he was twisting the heads off of neighbors' pets and chickens and birds and whatnot and tacking them onto their door jams. And then when he was 13, he was a full-blown alcoholic. Uh, he would sit in the class, drink beer, and crush the beer cans. And the teachers were so terrified of him, they wouldn't kick him out of class because they were afraid he was going to burn their house down. When he graduated high school, one week after graduating high school, when he was 18, he killed this member and ate his first human victim. He then got into the Army and, and became a medic. He applied for medical school. And the only reason he didn't get accepted, his grades were very good because they all gave him A's just to get him out of there, right? So, um, the only reason he didn't get accepted into medical school was he was under treatment for alcoholism in the Army. They finally kicked him out, and he went up to Milwaukee and lived there for four years with his grandmother, and he worked in a chocolate factory for four years. He took his paychecks, and he bought alcohol and drugs at night. I mean, he was a raging alcoholic. During the day, he ate for breakfast, lunch, and supper chocolate, 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 because it was free working in that factory. And after four years, when the chocolate didn't satisfy his cravings anymore for these minerals, his pica and his cribbing, symptoms. He killed, dismembered, and consumed 17 human victims. This is Jeffrey Dahmer. We could have picked him out when he was four years old, but they sent him to counselors instead of giving him some minerals and getting him off his sugar when he was four years old. Now, just a quick reminder uh, before we get into the final stages of this, uh, we need 90 essential nutrients. We need 60 minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 essential amino acids, and 3 essential fatty acids. And fortunately for human beings, over the thousands of years we've been around, we haven't had to think too much about the vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids because our food crops have been able to take um, energy from the sun, use chlorophyll through the photosynthesis process, and manufacture carbon chains, uh, which uh, included uh, vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids. And of course, um, Theoretically, you can get all the vitamins and amino acids and fatty acids you need from your grains and fruits and vegetables, although you have to eat six cups of 15 different um, plant foods every day to get enough vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids. In other words, six times 15, six cups times 15 different plants, that's 90 cups of fruits and vegetables a day. I mean, even if you had the belly capacity to do that, you'd be in the bathroom running through rolls of Charmin tissue all day <laughs> from that much fruit, right? Now. So it is theoretically possible to get your vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids from um, grains, fruits, and vegetables, but not really practical. And, of course, most people in America, they eat potato buds out of a Betty Crocker box, and I'm coming here from Idaho, you know about potato buds, uh, and they think they're getting a, a vegetable. So oh, I eat vegetables. I had the potato buds today. Then, of course, there was Wonder Bread. Remember uh, back 50 years ago when I, when I was growing up on the farm, we didn't have TV, and we, had, uh, we didn't even have dryers that went round and round to entertain ourselves. So we always listened to the radio, things like... Um, the Green Hornet and Captain Midnight and Inner Sanctum, and we'd make jelly sandwiches listening to these things with Wonder Bread. And I studied that Wonder Bread wrapper. I mean, I could tell you how many blue balloons there was, red, yellow, and so forth. And on the wrapper it said, helps build your body 12 ways. And about 10 years later, the FDA made them change it to help build your body eight ways. Now if you go into a grocery store and study the Wonder Bread wrapper, it just says Wonder Bread. And they made them take it all off of there, and you wonder what's in it. <laughs> <clears throat> So even though it's theoretically possible to get all the vitamins and amino acids and fatty acids you need from your food, I still recommend to my patients that you supplement with these things. Uh, you don't take a bag full of dirt from the Texas oil field and throw it in the crankcase of your car or tractor and say, well, there's supposed to be oil in there. But we do that for ourselves when it comes to food and vitamins and minerals. I just find that amazing. Now, minerals are a different story. Plants cannot manufacture minerals, and we need 60 essential minerals every day to prevent disease and death. Plants only have minerals in them 
based on whatever minerals are in the soil. And that's why we're in trouble in America, because for the last hundred years, and I know I did on our farm, and I'm, I'm assuming most people do on their farm, we used a very simple fertilizer called NPK, because back then, for 25 bucks an acre, it would give us the maximum yield in terms of tons and bushels per acre, and nobody paid us a, a cash incentive or gave us a tax um, incentive to um, make sure we had 60 minerals in the soil and therefore in our food plants. We were taught to grow tons and bushels, and we did a darn good job at it, and that's why we got paid. It only takes five to 10 years to deplete the essential minerals out of our soils, and if you irrigate, it goes faster than that. And for 100 years, we've been using NPK. Now, one of the things I want you to pick up, if you haven't already done that, is a free summary, when you leave tonight, is a free summary of U.S. Senate Document 264. U.S. Senate Document 264 says there's no more nutritional minerals left in our farm and range soils, and as a result, the crops that are grown there are minerally deficient. And as a result of that, the animals and people who eat these minerally deficient crops get mineral deficiency diseases, and the only way to, uh, to uh, prevent and cure them is with mineral supplements. Now, the scary thing to me about U.S. Senate Document 264 is it was written and published by the U.S. Senate in 1936. Fifty-nine years ago, this information was known. Did anybody ever give it to you before? No. And that's the time at which, in, in agriculture, we started putting vitamins and minerals and trace minerals into animal feeds, 1936. And humans, unfortunately for us, we got wonder drugs. This is when we got penicillin, sulfa drugs, and, and prednisone. And doctors said, we don't need to know about that nutrition stuff. People get sick. We give them some wonder drugs and cure them. U.S. Senate Document 264. Now this one here you should pay attention to. This is kind of an overlay map of the continental United States. And this shows you <clears throat> how much selenium is in the soil in various areas or regions of the country. The black areas have absolutely no selenium in it. The dark gray areas probably don't. It's kind of a maybe, maybe not. So if you eat food out of your own garden, or you go to a farmer's market and get very fresh fruits and vegetables or grains and whatnot, I, I still do on it from the field. In Idaho, are you getting any selenium? No. Farmers know they better give selenium to their sheep and their horses and their pigs and cows. Otherwise, you get white muscle disease or stiff lamb disease or mulberry heart disease. Why do we do that for our livestock and we don't take care of ourselves? Okay, just a quick detailed look at two minerals and we'll wind it up and we'll open it up for questions. Uh, let's look at calcium. Everybody knows about calcium since Tum started talking about uh, osteoporosis. Osteoporosis, of course, is a tragic disease. It's the number 10 killer of adults in the United States. It's very costly in terms of human misery in dollars. It costs $35,000 to have each hip replaced. If you get them both replaced, they're in fact um, uh, $70,000. Now, farmers know that we can prevent osteoporosis in animals, and we don't have osteoporosis in animals even because, or even though we have such a terrible time with it in humans. And here's why. Farmers are very practical. Let's say you have 100 head of cows out in the pasture and you didn't have any calves this year, can't repay your operating loan. You call the vet out and you say, man, do I get rid of this herd of cows? It cost me a lot of money this year, feed and labor and maintaining the fence and pasture, and I didn't get any calves. What's happening here? So the vet examines the cows. He says, no, there's nothing wrong with the cows here, but your bull over there has osteoporosis of both his hips, had so much pain, couldn't breed the cows. That's why he didn't have any calves. He says, I tell you what, you give me $70,000, I'll give that bull two new hips, and next year you'll have some calves. <laughs> <laughs> so a farmer being a practical guy says, stand over here, Doc. Boom! <laughs> Blows the bull away, 28 cents. And uh, well, the uh, uh, kids are grinding them up into hamburger and cutting steaks and roast off that old bull. The, the farmer says, now, Doc, for $70,000, I can get a new bull every year for 70 years. You know I wasn't going to spend that kind of money. Uh, but every once in a while, I get one I'd like to keep because he throws good calves. Uh, Any way I can prevent that osteoporosis thing. And the vet says, well, sure. Um, every time you wean one of those bull calves, just give him 10 cents a day worth of calcium in his pellets. And the farmer says, you mean I can prevent a $70,000 vet bill simply by giving 10 cents a day worth of calcium in the pellets? He says, well, yeah. He says, well, I'm going to do that because I don't have insurance for those uh, animals and because I have to pay for it out of my own pocket. I'm going to do the 10 cent a day thing. That's why we don't have osteoporosis in animals. Now, receding gums is another one. Dentists will tell you to floss and brush after every meal if you want to avoid or cure receding gums. If you believe that really works, I have some oceanfront property in Idaho to sell you. Because it doesn't work, I've seen hundreds of thousands of animals, rats, rabbits, mice, ra uh, dogs, cats, sheep, horses, pigs, cows, lions, and tigers, and bears, and they don't floss, and they don't get receding gums. Now, they do get funky breath. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, the reason why we don't get receding gums in animals is because we've taken care of the osteoporosis problem. Gingivitis, receding gums, loose teeth, uh, periodontitis, pyorrhea, bridges, plates, all of these different diseases really are just osteoporosis of the facial bones and the jaw bones. And that's why we don't have these problems in animals, because we've taken care of the osteoporosis problem. If you have any of those dental problems, you in fact have osteoporosis of the face or jaw bones. Arthritis. Now get your pencils out, because I'm going to give you that complete arthritis formula at this point. For those of you who stayed tonight and been a great audience, um, Dr. Wallach's pig arthritis formula goes like this. Five ounces of calcium-enriched Minute Maid orange juice. Five ounces of calcium-enriched Minute Maid orange juice. Two quarter ounce packets of Knox gelatin, unflavored and unsweetened. One ounce of mineral toddy for the colloidal minerals, including colloidal calcium and magnesium and boron. And one ounce of total toddy or ultra body toddy. This will give you the basic Dr. Wallach's pig arthritis formula. Take that twice a day, faithfully for two months, and then call me in the morning. I'll say it one more time. Five ounces of calcium-enriched Minute Maid orange juice, two quarter-ounce envelopes of Knox gelatin, unflavored and unsweetened, one ounce of mineral toddy, and one ounce of either total toddy or ultra-body toddy, which are vitamins, amino acids, and minerals. That mixture, seven and a half ounces, you want to take twice a day faithfully for two months before you decide whether it's actually helping your arthritis or not. Hypertension. High blood pressure is not due to too much salt in your diet. It won't help you if you take salt out of your diet. What's the first thing that a good husbandman puts out for his livestock? It's about that big. A salt block. And a dumb old cow can have all she wants. Now, doctors think people are dumber than cows. A cow can have all the salt she wants, but you can't have any. Right? Well, we learned um, five years ago from a study that was, was paid for with your tax money, $30 million they studied uh, high blood pressure. They took 10,000 people. 5,000 of which had high blood pressure. They took them off of all salt medications to see if just a salt-free diet would help people live longer. And of course, they all died very quickly. Can't live without salt. Then they took 5,000 people in a control group. They let them salt their food. In fact, encouraged them to salt their food to taste. And then they made them take three times the RDA of calcium. They don't even know why they did that. They just wanted to do something different in the control group, have nothing to do with salt. And that control group was supposed to run 20 years to compare with the other group that had already died out. Well, they had to stop the control group in six weeks because 85% of them were cured of their high blood pressure just simply by tripling your calcium intake. How many of you got that notice from your doctor saying it's okay to salt your food to taste, but please, please do double or triple your intake of calcium, especially if you have high blood pressure? Not a single person in this room. Okay. Insomnia. As we roll around all night, wake up in the morning more tired when you went to bed, that's not a barbiturate deficiency. It's a calcium deficiency. Okay, your doctor likes to give you barbiturates, kill about 10,000 people a year, but that's okay as prescription, so they keep track of the numbers for you. <laughs> they have a new one out called Halcyon. It doesn't kill you, but it has terrible side effects of stomach cramping, nausea, vomiting, and that's what they gave George Bush when he went to Japan uh, to sleep on Air Force One. You know, he's gonna, he was going to negotiate with the car uh, trade ambassadors there from Japan. And when I uh, came home, I always turn on CNN News, and I turn that on, and here's these Japanese newscasters. I thought the whole Japanese economy had collapsed. I mean, these guys were taking their ties off and throwing their jackets on the desk, and their hair was all over the place, sweat flying around. And they're saying things like, Oh, gozaimasu, konnichiwa, bush, bleh! <laughs> and then I saw that news thing with him puking all over them guys. I mean, he could blame his doctor's prescription for losing the, the presidency because that wasn't very presidential. <laughs> Then there's kidney stones, bone spurs, heel spurs, and calcium deposits. Doctors have the malignant, dumb belief that you have too much calcium in your diet when you get those things, and they say, absolutely no dairy, and for God's sake, don't take any supplements with calcium in it, when in reality, you only get calcium kidney stones, bone spurs, heel spurs, and calcium deposits when you have a raging osteoporosis. In reality, you need more calcium and more magnesium, not less. A couple more here, cramps and twitches. How many of you have ever had a foot cramp? Raise your hand, be honest. Just about everybody in the room has been awakened with a foot cramp, right? That's a calcium deficiency. Your body's screaming at you. Give me some calcium, darn it. <clears throat> then, of course, there's twitches, eyelid twitches, muscle twitches. Be honest. How many of you have ever had an eyelid twitch? Raise your hand. Yeah, just about everybody in the room. Now, when I was 14 years old, my eyelids used to twitch so loud you could hear them. I mean, it sounded like... And I'd look in the mirror and say, do people see that or is that my imagination? And I looked, sure enough, I, could, I caught it one day and I called my mom. Hey, mom, look at this. And she didn't know what it was, so we jumped in the car and we drove 80 miles to St. Louis 
we went to this lady eye doctor, I'll never forget her name was Mary Jane Skeffington. And for some reason, she had me stripped down to my jockey underwear. I mean, she was an eye doctor. I mean, today I'd get on Oprah with sexual harassment, right? But back then it was just kind of a curiosity. And what's, what's her interest here? You know? I mean, I was 14 years old. So at any rate, she'd look in my eyes and uh, kind of shrug her shoulders. She'd go look at another patient. She'd come back and look in my eyes. And, start, and after about an hour of that, I said, you know, Doc, look, I, I'm, I play on the junior varsity football team. I'm the captain of the wrestling team. I'm on the weightlifting team. If you have to amputate my eyelids, go for it. I mean, I can do whatever is necessary. I can't stand this twitching and cramping in my eyes. And so she knew I was frustrated. She goes to her office. She comes back with a little Maybelline mascara eyelash brush and a little mirror. I said, now, what's all that for? She says, well, your eyes appear to be normal, but you do have long eyelashes, and I think they've hit your glasses, curled back, and are tickling your eyeballs, and that's what's happening. <laughs> and I said, yeah. <laughs> and she says, and she starts demonstrating to me. She says, what I want you to do is every hour alternate eyes and start actually retraining your eyelashes. I said, no, wait a minute. You want me to sit on the football bench with 25 guys weighing over 200 pounds, and you want me to start playing with my eyelashes? I mean, these guys will sharpen their cleats and kill me. My own team will kill me. So I put on my pants, and I go marching off to the school library, and I look at a health book written by a couple of nurses, and I look in the index under muscle cramps, muscle twitches, and sure enough, it says calcium deficiency. Now, I'm 14 years old. The only place I knew we had calcium was in those calf pellets in the barn. So I ran to the barn, and I had to make this decision. Was I going to do this Maybelline mascara eyelash treatment, or was I going to eat calf pellets? So I started eating calf pellets. <laughs> Everybody else in school was popping M&Ms, you know, and I'm eating calf pellets. So in three days' time, all those cramps and twitches went away. And, of course, I knew then that doctors didn't know anything about anatomy <laughs> and probably, I didn't know what the connection was between the eyes and the other parts, and then they didn't know anything about nutrition. Now, PMS, premenstrual syndrome, the University of California six years ago came out and said that 85% of the physical and emotional stuff of PMS could, in fact, be reversed, prevented, and cured simply by tripling your intake of calcium over and above the RDA of calcium. So, guys, if you have a gal in your family, a mother, a sister, a wife, a daughter, or maybe a boss or co-worker, don't give them flowers and chocolate to try and calm them down. Give them some calcium and everybody will be happier. Now, low back pain. 85% of all back pain is due to either osteoporosis of the vertebrae, regardless of your age, even if you're 10 years old. If you have low back pain, you can have osteoporosis of the vertebrae or uh, cramps and spasms in the muscles. And so you want to use Dr. Wallach's pig arthritis formula for all of these things. Now, the criminal thing about this is these are just the top 10 out of 147 different diseases that can be caused by a calcium deficiency, just 10. Because we have good insurance and because we have Medicare and Medicaid, the average person in America will spend somewhere between $25,000 and $250,000 during their lifetime and undergo five to 10 surgical procedures for nothing more than a calcium deficiency. Any other industry where you can do something for 10 cents and they charge you $250,000, they get put in jail for fraud. But in medicine, we just ask the doctor or the uh, uh, government to tax us so we can pay them. I find that fascinating. Last one, diabetes. Number three killers of Americans, causes blindness of all kinds, kidney failure requiring dialysis or maybe kidney transplant, cardiovascular disease of all kinds, amputations of toes, feet, and legs. And if you really are determined to get an amputation, make sure you tag the right leg, you know, to make sure the doctor gets the right one. And uh, this is really criminal because every time your doctor um, diagnoses a new diabetic in his, his um, office, he drops to his knees and gives thanks to the Lord. And then when he gets up, he runs over and picks up the telephone, calls his real estate agent and says, hey, I need a new apartment complex or a strip mall or a farm. I need to dump $250,000 to $500,000 because I got a new diabetic patient. It's kind of like adding a new dairy cow to the herd. You know how much money you're going to get during the life, the useful life of that cow. Now, in 1957, we learned in animals that we could prevent and cure diabetes with two trace minerals. Adult onside, uh, onset diabetes, chromium and vanadium would prevent and cure it. Ten years ago, 1985, the medical school at the University of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, came out and said the trace mineral vanadium alone could replace insulin for adult onset diabetics. If you write science diet dog food in Topeka, Kansas, manufactured by Hill Packing Company, and ask them how many minerals are in science diet dog food, they'll proudly write you back and say, well, there's 40 in there, and they always include chromium, vanadium, lithium, and selenium. And then you write Checkerboard Square, St. Louis, uh, Ralston, Purina, and say, hey, how many minerals are in laboratory rat pellets? Well, we put 28 in there, unless a researcher wants more or less, we can do that. And we always include chromium, vanadium, lithium, and selenium. And I'll give anybody in this audience 
a crisp new $100 bill, if you can find me a human infant formula off the shelf of a grocery store or a um, pharmacy that has more than 12 minerals. None of them contain chromium, vanadium, or lithium, and only one pro soybean, the one that has 12, has selenium in it. None of the rest do. And you might have 11 or 10 or 9 minerals in there, depending on which one you choose arbitrarily off the shelf. So our dogs get 40 minerals, our rats get 28, and our own kids get 12 or less. Is it any wonder our society is beginning to crumble? Now, if I've convinced you that uh, being responsible for taking uh, these 90 essential nutrients is uh, your responsibility, you do have to learn this last piece of information. There are three types of minerals. Number one is metallic. These are things like ground up rocks, limestone, tongues, clays, dolomite, uh, oyster shell, eggshell, seabed minerals of all kinds, uh, sea minerals, things like uh, minerals from the Great Salt Lake and the ocean, stuff like that, Celtic salts. These things are only 8 to 12 percent available to little kids when you're under age 30, young people. They have a pretty good digestive system. We're not designed to eat rocks or metallic minerals or soil or clay or dirt. When you hit 40 or 50, when you hit that big 4 or 50, people dread those ages because you start getting those aches and pains and your hair turns gray and your teeth get loose and your blood pressure goes up. You start getting diabetes and all these problems. Um, that's because your ability to absorb metallic minerals drops down to 3 to 5 percent. It's a precipitous drop because you have a physiology change. And about a year ago, a guy jumps up in the back of the room in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, where I was giving a lecture like this, and he says, Hey, Doc, now I know what I see in my porta potty business. I said, What on earth do you see in your porta potty business? He said, Well, every time we clean those things out and hose them down and disinfect them to reuse them again, we find hundreds and hundreds of vitamin pills that come through people. I said, Come on now, how do you know they're vitamin pills? He said, Oh, that's easy. They say Theragram M, Centrum, Centrum Silver, and one a day right on the coating. <laughs> so next time you're on the pot and you hear plop, plop, fizz, fizz, you know what it is coming through there. And if you have some gas that day, you better jump off the pot because you don't want to get shrapnel in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> now, a lot of people will say to me, look, Doc, we heard you on the radio, we read your books, listened to your tapes, we heard you lecture several times. And we've been taking 2,000 milligrams of calcium every day for the last 20 years, and our teeth are still loose. The arthritis is still bad. The osteoporosis is getting worse. My blood pressure has gone up, and I get cramps all the time. And I'm taking 2,000 milligrams of calcium a day. What's going on? And I was asking, what kind are you taking? And they always tell me things like, well, calcium lactate. I take two of those 1,000 milligram capsules or tablets a day. Well, there's the problem, because out of those 1,000 milligram tablets, 860 milligrams is lactose or milk sugar. Only 140 milligrams is metallic calcium, and let's not use these complex numbers to figure out how much they're going to get. Let's just use 10%, uh, easy figuring, 10% of 140 is 14 milligrams. So if you take two of those tablets a day, you're not getting 2,000 milligrams of calcium. You're getting 2 times 14, or 28 milligrams of calcium. To get 2,000 milligrams of usable calcium from a metallic tablet, you have to, in fact, take 30 of those with each meal. You've got to take 90 a day. You've got to take almost a whole a bottle of 100 each day. And that's just dealing with calcium. We're not, I mean, you still have 59 more minerals to go. And if you do that, trying to do it, I guarantee you, you're going to develop what we call BNF disease. It's an abbreviation for belching and farting. You sound, <laughs> you sound like an elephant out in the woods with bowel problems. <laughs> and you know you have it when your spouse has to throw a canary in the bathroom to see if it's safe to go in there. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> now, during the 60s, the agricultural industry came up with chelated minerals because no farmer is dumb enough to put a dollar in an animal's mouth and have 99 cents come out in the manure. So we learned by putting amino acids, proteins, and enzymes around the metallic atom that we could increase the absorbability to 40%. It was a major breakthrough in mineral nutrition, and the health food industry jumped in there. And so if you look at multivitamin mineral tablets today, you'll see a mix of metallic minerals and chelated minerals. But the way that animals and humans are really designed to absorb minerals is in the colloidal form. They're 98% available to us, two and a half times more available than chelated, 10 times more available than metallic. And our food plants, grains, fruits, vegetables, and nuts, are supposed to take the metallic minerals out of the soil, convert them to colloidal minerals for their own use, and then uh, we eat the food plants and get the minerals. That's how we're designed to do this. We're not designed to eat dirt and rocks. We're designed to get our minerals from our food plants. However, the problem is U.S. Senate Document 264 says since 1936, 
There's no longer any nutritional minerals left in our soil. So even though the plants have the capability of doing that, they can't do it because the raw materials are not there in the soil anymore. And this is why we have this catastrophic disease appearance in America. Now what about these people who live to be 120 to 140? What is it that they do? What is it that, that makes them live healthily at 120 to 140? Well, they do have a common denominator, even though they're different religions and different races and cultures and so forth. Number one, they were all persecuted peoples. Either uh, they were persecuted for religion, they were persecuted for um, uh, their politics, and they were chased up into the mountains as a place to escape, of course, and hide. And they picked places where you had to cross a 3,000-foot deep chasm or you had to go through a little narrow pass where 100 guys could defend against 10,000, kind of like the old Spartans. And uh, as a result, there's no utilities up there, no heavy industry, no chemical farming, and there's no pollution in the air, water, and food. And according to the Russians, this... Um, accounts for about 10% of their health and longevity. Now the other 90% is more important, I believe, <clears throat> and it has to do with just to throw the dice. It's not something that they consciously did. They picked places that had 60 to 72 minerals in the parent rock of the places they live, and they also had to pick places that had glaciers for year-round uh, sources of water because they chose places that had less than two inches of precipitation a year, no rain, no snow, so they couldn't dry land farm, they had to irrigate. And the water that comes out from underneath these glaciers is not clear like Perrier or Evian or bottled water or tap water or clear well water. It looks like milk. It looks like whole milk. So they call it glacial milk. And not only did they drink this stuff and get 8 to 12 percent absorption of these ground up rocks when they were you know, under age 30 and then 3 to 5 percent absorption of these ground up rocks after age 30. More importantly, they irrigated with this glacial milk for 2,500 to 5,000 years, week after week, month after month during their growing season, year after year, generation after generation, for 2,500 to 5,000 years. And if you boil away a quart of that glacial milk, you get two inches of minerals in the bottom of that quart jar. You boil away a quart of Evian or Perrier water, you get as much minerals as you can put on the head of a pin. And as a result, all their food plants for 2,500 to 5,000 years have been taking up these metallic minerals, crop after crop, and are heavily laden with these colloidal minerals. By eating these food plants that are rich with these colloidal minerals, these people do not have diabetes, they don't have cancer, they don't have arthritis, osteoporosis, high blood pressure, they don't get cataracts, they don't have any birth defects, they don't have jails full of violent criminals and um, uh, drug addicts, they don't have a single clinic, hospital, or doctor amongst them. They don't have insurance amongst them. They don't have any taxes, simply because they have the raw materials that it takes to maintain and take care of their bodies and repair their bodies. Now, even if I were to pay your way to go there, most people in this room wouldn't go for any longer than a, a week curiosity visit, for instance. You might go for, for curiosity uh, to see what they do and how they live and so forth and taste the glacial milk, but you wouldn't live there, uh, even if I would pay your way to do it, because they don't have Kenmore kitchens or cars or air conditioning or heat or electricity. They don't have TVs, TV channel changers. They don't have sports teams. They don't have anything we like to think about as being American. So can you get these colloidal minerals and still stay in America and keep all the things that we love? And of course, the answer is yes. I'm going to give you a quick two-minute commercial here, and um, uh, we can go ahead and uh, open it up for questions then. Number one, uh, 1926, a prospector in the southeast of uh, Utah, about uh, 132 miles southeast of Salt Lake City, discovered a prehistoric valley that had a very special deposit in it. It happened to be a prehistoric forest that had taken up all the metallic minerals in the walls and floor of that valley in the prehistoric days. And as a result, those plants were rich with colloidal minerals. And there was a volcanic eruption, entombed that forest, and it was a very thin layer of mud, ash, and lava, not heavy enough to compress this into coal or oil. And it was very arid in there, so it never petrified or fossilized. And um, as a result, this is very unique stuff. And we grind this up into a flour. We soak it in cold water, a filtered spring water from the nearby mountains. And it leaches these colloidal minerals out of that deposit. After about four weeks, you get the maximum leaching is about 38 grams per quart, and you boil out a quart of this stuff. It's called mineral toddy. It's been on the market since 1926. You get an inch of these colloidal minerals in the bottom of that quart. Okay? And it's very, very interesting stuff. It contains 72 colloidal minerals, 60 of which we know to be essential. Now, I encourage you to um, put it in Minute Maid orange juice that's uh, calcium enriched because if you try and drink it straight, you know, I'm tough, I can take it straight, it'll shrink wrap your lips over your teeth. It's very astringent. <laughs> to be honest with you, you won't like it if you take it straight. You want to take it uh, in Minute Maid orange juice that's calcium enriched and also as part of Dr. Wallach's pig arthritis formula. And you can interchange either total toddy or ultra body toddy, whatever available, 
for the vitamins, amino acids, plus the minerals, as the other part of Dr. Wallach's pig arthritis formula, and ask them out there about, at the tables how to become a wholesale buyer so you get a 30% discount. You don't want to pay retail if you don't have to. You save yourself 30%. Lastly, uh, we have some books and tapes out there. If you like what you heard tonight, uh, I have a book. It's a best-selling book called Let's Play Doctor. It teaches you how to use vitamins and minerals and herbs and alternative therapies for over 400 diseases. It teaches you how to um, read medical lab reports, uh, prescriptions, records, and so forth, so the doctor can't get ahead of you there. And you're, you're going to save your life and a lot of money and uh, unnecessary misery. We have another book just on mineral deficiencies called Rare Earths Forbidden Cures. We also have some $3 cassettes. They're called Dead Doctors Don't Lie Appropriately. How many of you saw The Tonight Show the other night? Okay, did you see that? <laughs> did anybody? Okay, well, they had a 97-year-old lady on there who is a uh, handwriting expert. She's one of the people who used the Dr. Wallach's pig arthritis formula. I met her four years ago. Uh, when she was uh, 93 and she came in she was kind of like a wilted rag her daughters brought her in kind of under the armpits and they kind of just put her in a chair and she immediately fell asleep put her on dr wallach's pig arthritis formula three months later i went back there and gave a lecture and she walked up the steps holding onto the rail and tennis shoes and she sat down ten minutes later she was asleep i went back there six months later and she's running up the steps in her tennis shoes and she has all her girlfriends with her and they're chattering and giggling and now she she was on the tonight show the other night because uh, she'd just written a book. She'd been wanting to do it for 40 years, and she never had the energy until she was on Dr. Wallach's pig arthritis formula. I want to thank you all very much. God bless each and every one of you, and God bless America.